Welcome to the Crash Chords Podcast. You missed the third beat. Did I? There's a third one? I, I think there's a third. I think... No, there's only... No, that's in the second phrase. I'll edit it in post. Uh, so you'll, you'll I think it. everything will edit it. Be in it. Uh, See? Ba, ba. It's, that's but that's it. in the second Thank phrase. Thank you. I think that's in the second phrase. Nice. Yeah, the, the intro doesn't right. have that one. No, it's only in 2010. Listeners, help us out. No, it might be in the first phrase as well. It's definitely in the second phrase. Mm. See if it's... Potentially right. I'm not going to call him right, but he's potentially right. All right, see? It's getting interesting already. We'll talk we'll, later. Welcome to the Crash Chords Podcast. This is one of the episodes for the books. Um, of course, I'm Matt. I'm John. I'm Steve. And our guest this week is the one and only Andy Anders Heidel of The Way Station. Hello. Welcome to the show. It's good to be here. Um, you've been a topic of conversation a lot. Uh, we've had guests who've played the, the, the Way Station, like Circadian Clock and The Wasties, of course. And... Uh, I always bring you up in conversation because most of the live music I've seen in the last two years has been at your bar. And when we're not talking about you directly, we're talking about uh, the, the way station. station. And its ambience and the people we see and the, the songs we hear and all that sort of stuff. The it's people. The people. I didn't say that. Yeah, no, you just had a people visit. You, would, you adopted a brogue. <laughs> oh, I, like I think I'll keep the brogue. <laughs> Challenge. In my back pocket. Challenge. Um, but it's always, it's been, I think, collectively one of our favorite bars for quite the longest time now. It's definitely a great venue to see music in um, and or the shows that you put on there. It's just, it's set up for it, especially with the new stage set up. You can kind of bring the whole room in and it really pulls everything together, which is really cool. It's centrally Thanks. located. Yeah. It's not far from the S train, the Franklin Avenue shuttle, which is awesome. <laughs> it's just unique. It's a unique Brooklyn thing. And, you know, if you're near that, you got, you got cred. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that in, in that, my, that maybe shuttle. my universe and no one else's. Well, yeah. that's important to you, Steve, so we'll take it. That's right. That's why he's here. For, uh, for me. <laughs> right. Yes, of course. Totally for you. Um, of course, me and Eddie have been good friends for a while now. Ever since the bar opened, I've been a fixture there, and I love it there. Um, we, of course, asked you to bring an album. Um, so why don't you tell us the album you brought and a little bit about why you brought it to us. Great. Um, brought to the new Bell and Sebastian album. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine was uh, talking about how they had a new album out, how it was a dance album, and I just couldn't wrap my head around the idea of Bell and Sebastian doing a dance album, and so this is actually the first album I've bought this year. Oh, wow. Um, so I see so much and hear so much live music uh, at my bar, and I'm also vetting some of the, uh, the musicians that play there. Uh, I don't get to hear a lot of new stuff unless I'm driving, and then it's I can't figure out how to sync up my phone with a card. <laughs> that's a rent card, so I'm listening to Top 40, to see what the kids are listening to these days. Um, so I was happily surprised when I started listening to the new Bell and Sebastian and uh, found myself really enjoying it. So it uh, you know, from the first song, it reminded me of the old Bell and Sebastian. You know, mm. it's uh, Tiger's Milk, If You're Feeling Sinister, and The Boy with the Arab Strap, which was... Um, I used to listen to all the time. I remember painting apartment rooms uh, with those uh, playing in the background. Uh, and uh, it was, you know, like visiting with an old friend. It does make for really, really good background music. I noticed that even when I got into them. Just a little bit of background uh, on the band here. Bell and Sebastian formed in Glasgow in January 1996 by Stuart Murdoch, and uh, there was another Stuart in there. I think it was Stuart and Stuart, plus also the college professor at whatever music college they attended in Glasgow. And it's a little thing on the name. There is no Bell and there is no Sebastian. The name actually comes from Bell et Sebastien, which was uh, a 1965 children's book by French writer Cécile Aubry. So there's that little tidbit of information you can hang on your shoulder. Steve has that book on his shelf, I believe. Uh, absolutely. Signed first edition. Yeah. And also it was later adapted for television. That he got uh, from the author. There you go. Because he's old. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so back to the college. <laughs> yeah, that. Um, they, as far as I know, at that college, there was another member of the band which was one of their music professors. And also, they were lucky enough to have a label at that college. And the label was called Electric Honey. And Electric Honey liked what they had so much that they decided, well, you know what, we're just going to 
release a full-length album, and that turned out to be Tiger's Milk. So, yeah, they already had a lot of experience under their belt as of 1996. I think they released two albums in 1996 of Tiger's Milk and whatever one followed that was, like, released later the same yep, year. if you're feeling sinister. Yep, that's so it. So here we are, 20 years later. 20 years later. Um, back to that comment you mentioned about, like, uh, them being really good background music, because that's something I noticed. Uh, I noticed that the time that I got into them, around, like, 2004, my friend, like, handed me this hard drive with, like, a whole bunch of music on it. It was just like, here, listen to this. And I received it, and one among them was Bell and Sebastian. And I was like, it was almost a little intimidating at the time because I realized that they were such a prolific band for the late 90s and the early 2000s. So it was like, okay, six, seven albums. You know, most of the stuff he handed me was like brand new bands with their debut albums. So I'm like, okay, all right, I can, I can start into this stuff. But then here was like this band with quite a lot under their belt. And I wondered why I hadn't heard much about Bell and Sebastian before. It's not to say that they weren't necessarily popular, but it, is, it does seem as if they didn't gain the commercial success that you'd think their type of music would warrant. You used probably one of the most excellent metaphors to describe that, and that was the phrase musical parsley, which is just like the kind of thing you could... Ex you, you see exactly what that is. It's like something you can't quite pin down the taste, but it's not something that's like really leaping out to you in, the, uh, in your dish. It's just sort of this subtle little additive, something you notice and you enjoy, but you're not exactly sure what it is. You could, probably couldn't describe it later if you had to. And that's how a lot of their albums came off to me. And also another reason was that sort of indie rock sound. There's a tendency amongst indie rock to borrow from a lot of things. I remember we had this interesting discussion back in like episode 106 where we talked about like, well, what really separated indie and what really separated alt. And there does seem to be that desire for an alt rock band to really leap out or do something experimental or different. But for indie, it's really more about what they can borrow. And uh, Bell and Sebastian were always really good at borrowing. They would borrow from 80s pop. They would borrow from folk heavily in their earlier career. And, I don't know, all these things just kind of, like, added together to, to fill out this really pleasant background noise. It's not to d dispute their work as not really being uh, pertinent to the musical scene. It's just they don't, they've never written a bad song. Yeah. That's the claim I would probably make for them going into this album, which is what number? In uh, their discography? I don't know. They had, like, six at the time. What are we yeah, looking at? Like, I think we're up to, like, nine. Nine. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Don't quote us on that in case we're wrong. Or just yell at us on the, on the posts on the website. Yeah, or just look it up on Wikipedia for yourself. Use yeah. expletives, you know. To we're not supposed consent. to know everything, damn it. Send a comment. Yeah, right? <laughs> Tell us what you're feeling. <laughs> oh, no. I don't like those comments. Not yet. We haven't, we haven't begun. So, Anybody uh, else have any history with Bell and Sebastian before we I get I mean, I know the band. I've listened to their older stuff. But I couldn't call up specific songs off the top of my head. But I know if I heard them, I'd probably recognize them. They were one of those bands that were kind of... Ubiquitous for me in the 90s is just one of those other bands. That well, a lot, was, a lot was the vocalist. The vocalist yeah. has a very distinct sound. Um, I noticed that like Scottish brogue that he has tends to kind of like seep into the rest of the music, where not a lot of uh, British singers in general really do have that. A lot of times it just kind of like, especially to an American audience, it just feels as... as a, a normal vocalist that's like, eh, it's, it's, it's almost like media, like watching television. You just hear it as a voice, and you don't really hear the accent within that. But I noticed that um, with Bell and Sebastian, it's a little bit more pronounced. But that could also be the lisp that he has along to it. It almost sounds like there's this, this extra little lilt that he adds to the ends of phrases. That's what separates it from the pack. It, it, does, it is definitely a standout vocalist uh, in this band. And I think that's what's gotten them a lot of attention because the emotionality that comes through in their music through the vocals. Um, the new album, of course, that we're talking about is Girls in Peacetime Want to Dance. So the idea that this might be a dance album and it references dance in the title is interesting. And there's definitely some stuff to dance to on the record, but we'll get to that. So uh, the first track on the album is called Nobody's Empire. Um, this is the introduction or introductory track. And from the minute it starts, it feels very Bell and Sebastian. It starts very light and airy, kind of the, the typical sound you would expect well, from this band. I didn't get that initially. Like, as of the very beginning, like the first 8, 16 bars, I noticed it was just like this sort of eh, standard pop four-chord progression, which didn't really hint at anything quite yet. And then all of a sudden, when it really begins right into the verses, then I noticed that you get that carefree, uh, those carefree vocals, and also that perk of having really long, expansive melodies. That, I think, was something that hinted more at, at traditional Bell and Sebastian. And it was also beady and poppy. It, it's... It jumped. There was percussion in it that jumped around that, that was really hitting the mark over and over again, which just kept the song going along, which did cement it for me because I'm coming into this as uh, not knowing anything. It cemented it to me as a very 
good pop, but still very much within the safer realm of pop music itself? Um, I mean, it really kind of depends on what angle you're coming to from it. Again, if you accept uh, their background music style as most of their fans did, then it would be like, all right, yeah, no, it, it's it's Bell and Sebastian at that point. By the by, the time you get past the introduction, there's always this little safeness I think that comes with a lot of indie rock, but it's not it. I don't know, the direction that they take, and this brings me to another element, always adds this, like, twang of melancholy that seems to, like, detract from what perhaps a, a typical pop audience could digest. Well, in this case... I, I in this case, it's not really there. Yeah, I agree there's, with that. No, there's no real major melancholy. When you, when you start dissecting the layers of, of the music going on, the guitar, the bass underlays really do more uplifting. Now, it is low-key, and his vocals speak to that, but it is still an, a more energizing and uplifting song. Not it, necessarily going to get you bouncing yet, where this is not yet the dance album, but it is enough to get you in the right frame of mind to do something of that sort. Well, for one thing, it's low-key because the guitar isn't really pervasive. The guitar is merely just... Uh, it's, it's actually more color or, or, or rhythm driving than anything else. The bass is a lot more prominent, and I think what defines this, the, the riff of this opening track is the dynamic between the bass and the piano. That's what I think kind of makes this seem a little bit more low-key, a little bit more recessed. But it's, it's still... I don't know. It's still kind of like fun to groove to in the same way. It's just not as outlandish as you'd expect from typical pop. Well, you're getting piano work. You're getting xylophone interspersed in between everything. You get late horns going on. There is a lot more layering going on here from your standard pop, but it did take me a little while. To it's really an start. opportunity to get those layers. Yeah, I was, I was, I was having to dissect it and listen for them. When and once I heard them, I was enjoying them. Yeah. Well, it's one of those songs, also. I think that because of the way he sings and his his banter or his. Uh, his effect, uh, affectation, it kind of gives a nursery rhyme feel, especially with the lyrical quality, the, the uplifting feel, the xylophone, it feels very almost childish. Not not immature, just very kind of for kids, kind of a very easygoing, lighthearted thing. And it's that nursery rhyme feel to it that definitely makes this song, for me, an earworm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's still running through my head. Yeah, that, that nursery rhyme feel is something that... that was one of the first things I noticed once I got deeper into the melody that he always sort of went back to the same phrase and it reminds me so much of like Ring Around the Rosy um, you know pocket full of posies and it's like that's just ingrained within this melody that it feels like a conscious choice to, to, to bring that in and also the lyrics do support that as um as you noted at some point someone sang a song and I sang mm -hmm. along because I knew the words from my childhood intellect ambition they fell away and they locked me up for my own good just right there, someone sang a song and I sang along. That, I mean, that's already promoting the catchy feel that's, that obviously is pervasive in this song. Because I knew the words from my childhood. I like that turn of phrase because it's showing the, the kind of retrospective attitude he may be going on with this album. And that's a nice little insight right away into just what the band's going to be doing. Right, and it was something that was also similarly done uh, early on. I remember back in... Episode 32, we looked at Robbie Williams' album. Uh, what was it? Take the Crown, yes. Matt? Yeah, that's right. Take you brought on that album. Mm -hmm. And their big single, I think it was like a third track or something like that, Candy, yeah. used almost the same exact melodic motif. I couldn't help but think even at the time that it was referencing Ring Around the Rosie. And also when you think about the, the theme behind that song, like Candy comparing it to something that's just like a, a, a child's perk, you know, yeah. something that they might find uh appealing, and which we talk is very, eternal in a way. And we talk very strongly about how that was in your room as well. Is that while you had hit or miss feelings on a lot of the album, you you couldn't get that song out of your Nursery head. Nursery rhymes are inherently earworms because we sit with them for our entire lives. Yeah. I think the song really, as far as an intro track, really stays with you and kind of gets you going for the album, which is kind of a nice start to a record from a band, at least for me, that I haven't heard in a while. It was a nice kind of... It got me comfortable with the band again. There was also another thing that this first track did, and it was... It seemed to bring out, like, this sort of 1970s ballad feel. Like, it had... Especially every single time it went back to the chorus, it always felt like every, every time the choir steps in for that chorus to kind of accompany what he's saying, it was so, like... Uh, I felt like it was on, on the very edge, like the tail end of Motown. Like, there seemed to be okay, that, yeah, that. that influence there as well. And it's like all of these things don't really amount to a, a departure of Bill and Sebastian's sound because, as I said, they did tend to borrow a lot back in the day. It all just kind of falls into what you'd expect from that indie rock feel. It's like, well, they pull from what they need to, and they probably own it a little bit. Yeah, and I mean, they've always been a band that kind of 
when they borrow, they still make it their own a bit and kind of blend it to what their style is. Yeah. It was also a longer song than I expected, and that tends to be a... Uh, uh, it's not like overtly long songs, but these songs do tend to be a little longer than your average pop song. It seems like they often make their statement uh, well before they choose to end. They don't they they don't wrap it up concisely. Instead, they kind of drag it out. But that's okay because a lot of times in an earworm situation, you're not going to be sitting there just like you know, come on, get it over with. It also may be a product of just the fact that they tend to have longer melodies, like you said. They yeah. tend to have more expansive melodies. So maybe you do want to sit with it for a little bit longer. Maybe they do want to explore it a little bit deeper. You don't want to get, you know, a shortened repetition of this melody. You don't want to get a, an abbreviated version of it. You want to have it, give it some time to breathe. And give that's what some, they do here. Right. And they do so by having verse after verse after verse, a lot more than you'd have in a typical pop or even indie rock track. So, uh, yeah, quite layering on quite a bit here as of the first track. Let's move on to the second, unless anyone has anything else to say. Nope. 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 All right. Alley. So this song starts with a very strumming kind of 60s rock and roll kind of guitar, um, Beatles-esque, or I guess even maybe Queen to a little bit of a, a, yeah. a point, you know, right. that kind of very, very what you would picture as rock and roll for that time. It certainly rang of late 60s to yeah. me. Yeah. And it, it's an interesting way to start the song considering the way the first track started, which was way more airy and kind of floaty. Kind of, kind of uplifting, as we were saying. This is more kind of down to earth, very more, it's a little a, more hands in it, kind of grungy kind of thing. Got a grit, got a punch. <laughs> it's got a grit. Yeah, there we go. Rattle off your Rolodex. Yeah. yeah, there you go. But there is something that does connect it to the previous track. It, the speed is still there. The bounce is still there. It's not as fast. The tempo's been slowed down a little bit. The percussion is not as like ever present, but it's still within that same sort of a realm of a, a, a kind of a get up kind of a song a get up and go kind of a song not not full heavy disco beat work or anything like that but it's it marries to the guitar but it keeps it still married to the what we got in the first song well i think one of the reasons it feels so like so get up and go as we're putting it like all throughout is because th this track is almost designed in such a way that even the verses kind of sound like choruses from the very beginning you get ali what would you do when there's bombs in the middle east you want to hurt yourself when there's knives in the city streets you want to end yourself when there's fun in your mother's house you want to cry yourself to sleep this has this like overpowering you know it's almost kind of an earworm in itself also because of the cadence in which he sings those lines it's it's very bouncy inherently so it comes across as a kind of chorus but really by the time you get to what i find to be the actual chorus you still kind of feel that there is that like spotlight on the words and on on the um on the phrases at this point you're in you're in the mess because you thought you'd be somewhere else because the tricks in your head are a lie yeah the tricks in your head are a lie yeah the tricks in your head are a lie this refrain they keep coming back to all of this in in a slightly different um a slightly different chord progression it, it's it's just as as pertinent as the first verse there never seems to be that traditional recession as you'd have for a verse where like oh well let's tell the details of the story and then finally the statement the refrain here strikes me as two refrains and that second refrain, the one you just said, is where I, I really started honing in and loving the voice that's coming through my, my headset, that's coming through the speakers. Because it's not just because the tricks in your head are a lie, it's, it's the lilt he throws in that word lie, it's the rising action he throws in there. From somewhat of a softer tone, it's impactful. But that said, it's really the only impactful f part for me. Because that first verse, very dark. The whole motif of this song should be really, really dark, but that bounce that's still present, while musically connects to the previous song, somewhat disconnects the message of the lyrics and the content of the lyrics to me. See, the only way I would visualize it is that while this may not have like a, a dark element to it, you know, on the music side, as you put it, I, I think that there's really more a, a condition of imminence here. Uh, Considering we're probably looking at a suicide situation, um, Annie, what would you do when there's bombs in the Middle East? It, it seems to kind of like put the spotlight on her as if to say, well, you know, uh, and this certainly comes back into bridge. Um, there's other things going on in the world. It's like it's not really as bad as you think. And 
that's kind of a sweet message, but it also is an imminent message. It's like if she's on the brink of doing it, then th I think the high energy is the, is the condition of imminence, that something needs to be done now. Otherwise, you know, she be, could be gone within the hour. I don't think that disconnect is as strong as you say it is, John. Like, I understand where you're coming from. It does make sense. There are hints of the fact that you could miss the message just based on the music. But I think if you could really concentrate on everything that's happening, you can find it within it. It's just, it's presented differently than we would normally expect. And also that bridge that I was just discussing, it goes, and this is really the one moment in which it does seem really, really uh, recessed. It's actually the only breather that this song seems to take, as if, let's call it kind of like that little aside. Yes, mm -hmm. if we have imminence throughout, this is like that little personal aside. And that is, and you thought about what they went through. Yeah, you thought about what they went through, and it's much darker, much harder than anything that happened to you. Ali, what would you do? It's a really, really sweet message, and I, I don't know, I, I guess it made me kind of gloss over this, but I also have that thing where early in the albums, I'm, I'm not really that judgmental in terms of tone. I think it's, a, it's sufficiently rousing, well, and it also has a message. Yeah, and that's what, I, that's what made me uh, look up and start regarding this as something much different than your standard pop. Forgetting even the extra layering and the cool stuff we got in the first track, or the interesting pieces that are working in here, just the lyrical approach is really interesting, is impactful in and of itself. Now, at times, even here, it's a little bit better to read it than to, to follow along with them because, I'll be honest, beautiful voice, but it's hard to see the impact of the story through his vocal work in this case for me. Um, he's talking something dark, he's talking something deep, and... With, with that, that high range, it's hard to really get the same impact and if you were working with a baritone, if you're working on the deeper scale. But then again, I haven't heard a lot of his music. I don't know if he can do a baritone. I don't know if anybody in the band can do something that deep, and I wouldn't say get somebody just to do it. I always just classified him as a tenor. I never really saw him straying <laughs> north or south of the tenor range. So uh, he's but I, I, and that's his why range. it was just an yeah. interesting observation. I, I, yeah. Range was not was not something that I had thought of in this track. I thought it was it, maybe again just because I'm familiar. It's like it's him, therefore it's appropriate. Yep. <laughs> but I know what you mean about the um, you know the message, and it's also the lyrics get kind of lost. Uh, you know, but I was listening to this, and you were talking about the lyrics. Like re read the lyrics, <laughs> and how there was that disconnect. But uh, reminded me of uh, Shotgun Kids, and it's like run better run faster than my bullets mm. and it's just like that the message really stood out that it was clear what he was singing was clear right yeah so you could tell that there was this dark message within a lighter tone whereas here it was kind of buried b below the music yeah yeah um the funny thing is also you know i, I it's I, I trying to grapple with again that condition in which i've associated them as background music it's like i do see some kind of leaping out here because I don't know, even when they're at their rowdiest, I still find it appropriate to, the, to like, painting, cooking, you know, boombox at the beach, that kind of thing. But even this seemed, like, a little bit out of character for them. But I was okay with that. It was like, again... It feels like it they're really evolving or branching out. Evolving or branching out, or even just as indie rock, they choose different things of what they want to focus or borrow from. In this case, it was late 60s rock. Why they chose late 60s rock as, a, as an avenue to pursue this particular theme and suicide, I don't know. Uh, but I feel like it kind of worked. Well, that that could just be the history of lo looking back retrospectively on classic rock and the fact that, well, they love to breach serious topics. Yeah. It could have been that sort of artistic choice. Yeah, but then it should have been when there's bombs in Vietnam, you want to hurt yourself. <laughs> well, no, you gotta you gotta update it. You gotta bring it into the 21st century because that's course. where we live right now. And they did but so. But then the, one of these things is not like the other, and that's the musical sound. You want the millennials to understand, of course. Well, yeah, they, they, most of them can't spell Vietnam. <laughs> There's a modicon for it. <laughs> right. No way. I, I, I would. I I gotta get Google that. it. I will yep. definitely Google it later. <laughs> you as well, audience. I think it's a good time you should to Google move on. it. I hear it's a new thing. <laughs> uh, next track we get is The Party Line. Now this, right away, daft? Is it club? Is it what? This is club pop. I heard club initially. I just club pop all the way up until 32 seconds. And there's even like a, a little bit of a step up even within that those 32 seconds. Like, all right, yeah, they dropped the bass. It's very predictable at this point. And then finally, 32 seconds, we get funk. Yeah. And that's not something that I'm... Uh, Accustomed to with Bell and Sebastian, and I have to say that within a bar, they pulled it off 
effortlessly. And it's not just funk. That's the whole thing. It's still more modern funk. It's still a take on it because they're using uh, electronica elements and electronica oh, hey. styles within it. That funk doesn't die. Funk never died. Just Man. fades away. Oh. But it's a, it's a once Don't again... Don't you dare talk about my funk that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's an updated version of a previous idea. But it was such a turn that... I, it, it was a it was a wake up call because it really almost almost felt like a departure from the first two tracks because I didn't know where they were, where they were going with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is when they start to deliver on the party album. Yeah, uh, yeah it's a party a album here, I which mean, is definitely not a dynamic <laughs> I'm familiar with for Bell and Sebastian. But I'm intrigued. But the groove, I mean, the groove here is actually instantly catchy, much like the first track. You kind of kind of get hooked in right away. And the transitions from each part of this track are also super smooth. They're very good with the post-production transitions. I think it's got a flow that, while we weren't expecting dance music, I'm not surprised how this song flows for a Bell and Sebastian song, even within this format. I feel like within the format, it still feels like them. And oh, man. There's, there's, there's multiple elements that actually do show up, like um, the guitar and beat-driven interludes that are dispersed here and there throughout the song well, the like, fact that there's a lot of background synth work that's being like that that shows up and pushes through because otherwise without these additional layers it's freaking boring but those layers do shine through at the appropriate times to really draw me back in when my mind starts wandering because the song itself is very much the party song well actually that's kind of an interesting point because that almost <laughs> That kind of reads into a, a incisive criticism of funk, because funk essentially just has one goal, and that is to get you up dancing. That's yeah. really it. There's not, they're not going to move into, like, you know, various sections, part B, part C. Well, then again, some do. But it, it, the basic format of a funk track, the bare bones of it is all you need. The rest is kind of superfluous. It kind of just makes it a little bit more intriguing as you go. And a lot, one of the ways that you do that is through layers. In this particular case, you get a lot of little things. I really enjoyed the, the, the quality of the bass as having this little warping effect toward it. It just seems that it's constantly like on a pitch bend, happy spree, uh, front to back. Secondly was the, the, the synth, sort of like making these little crescendos here and there. Also, like by the last third of the track, we get these little inter- interludes of... of flutes, which may just actually be like a synth with like a flute effect on it, but it still sounds pretty fluty to me. And uh, finally, the, the keyboards, just like just comping as we go, little like broken chords on the ninth, you know, just hammering that out for effect. Really like, it, they sound like disparate things. It's just like, all right, that's layers, but it's, it's key to the enjoyment of this track. That is really what holds it together. So I, I, I see your point. It's the glue. And there's one little aspect that we haven't touched on yet. The lyrics. And here's where I think the song really shines because we have a really danceable, uplifting, funk party song that is actually talking about the fact that the party's kind of over at this point. That the party is sort of a a, a fake. People like to drive their cars and smoke up. People like to sit inside and toke up. People like to shoot things with borrowed guns and knives. I'm happy to look and run. Where were you when I was king in this part of town? Now the days of glory are gone. Oh, it's, it's the it's the after the party. Sad after this party. Is the, yeah, this is the, the one guy who isn't growing up, even though everyone around him. They're is still changing. doing that dun, 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 head bob thing from the old you know, skit and everything like that. Night at the Roxbury. Exactly that they actually made a freaking movie for. But that's besides the point. It's a satire. When it gets down to the core of it, when you actually take the lyrics and the music, it's a satire. And that's something I didn't actually get on my first listen through well, because it felt like just a party song. What I also really like is that his vocals translated really well to this pop structure, which is unsurprising because they always had pop influences. But I think in this format, he really did shine singing a little bit differently, but still in a very Bell and Sebastian kind of way. But it, he was able to have a little fun with it fitting this format. And there was also something else. Like, I felt as if this was sort of seamlessly transitioning back and forth between uh, a more modern pursuit of funk and also more of, like, a traditional uh, disco motif here and there. I I, I noticed it, like, in certain parts, it'd be like, yeah, that seems to be in a stronger disco style. Like, more, that was more in his vocals, I think. But then especially when the bass steps forward, it's like, eh, that, that doesn't feel as 70s hinted. It feels like a more modern rendition. And both of this actually, maybe th- considering John's point on, on the, 
uh, the satirical purpose of this track made me think that it's not really just the after party. It's like not, it's like years have passed yeah. in a sense, and this is really like, hey, remember when we used to party? Remember yeah. when I was king of this? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's remember. It's not really when, so immediate. It's, it's reminiscent it's and reflective. Yeah, as 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 far as well as those other things. It's it's an interesting combination because you could take it both ways. You could take it as a pure party song, or you could see the joke. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And unlike the previous track, I felt it worked perfectly. I mean, to go the full satire route is great, and it's something that they kind of do later on in the album a few times. I like that because this lyrical content is building up um, not a complete story yet. We're, we're sort of getting there, but it's, it's shaping an, a, a specific individual as we go along. Yeah, and also considering, you know, I'm a funk guy, it's like at this point, eh, they really didn't have to layer on any of this stuff. They could strip the lyrics away and then just left the song and I would have been intrigued. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're playing both sides against the middle, and they're doing it well. Let's go to track five. Nope, well, let's go to track four, which is actually the next track. Let's go to track four. Um, the Power of... <laughs> True, the Power of Three. Um, this was a somewhat airier track. Uh, the, uh, the main little feature here is the fact that it begins with a, a hook that uh, characterized by a synth that recurs again and again and again throughout the entire track. And the synth sort of has this, like, screeching effect. Um, it happens over a ma- F major chord, and then beneath that, there, or rather on top of that, th- the melody itself is seems to be almost in Lydian. Like, it steps down into this, like, sharp four, which it, it kind of, like, reacts against the F major in a little way. It just makes everything seem just a little bit strange, as if... The music is almost hinting at a certain lyrical element here, a kind of third wheel. Yeah, but the interesting thing lyrically is that this is actually very explicitly talking about uh, Sherlock Holmes, Watson, and Moriarty. Is it explicit, though? I I feel like it's metaphorical. No, no. That's that's only one of the uh, the lines. Uh, He's also talking about the the Zodiac. Yeah, yeah, and then he's... um, it's it's completely uh, not completely continually references Holmes, Watson, Moriarty, the trifecta, the idea of friend and enemy being close to you, mm. which is an interesting idea, but it's kind of choppy in its actual delivery. All lyrically. Right. Well, let's take it in context. Some people say two is company. Sherlock Holmes found the sign of four. I don't listen to that number theory. I'm all, I'm always looking for a trio, them and me. One for all, and we're all for one. Musketeers have got to have the power of three. So there's that reference in there, too. Okay. Every time I read the horoscope, I read three. Virgo, Pisces, Aquarius. Nobody can tell what's down the road for us. You could be Holmes. I'll be Watson. Even Hero. Yes, even me. Everybody has their Moriarty. Okay. It's. I'll admit it's a meandering metaphor. Yeah. But it's... It is a metaphor. Yeah. Uh, and I think the, through the whole thing, it's coming back and referencing the Holy Trinity. Yeah, I see and that so too now. And trying to find the, the divine in daily life. Yep. But the references also to lines with your en- uh, keep your friends close, your enemies at your side, things like that. I mean, it's not all fun and games. It's not all positive. There's negatives associated here. It's it's sort of you have to have a compatriot versus a a villain. You have to have someone that challenges you that you're not friends with that makes you strive to fight against that's that's Holmes and Moriarty they're always trying to one up one another that's that's the basis of one of the greatest uh, book series of all time that though just like I said before doesn't come through very clearly it's one way or the other it might be just the Holy Trinity at mm-hmm. times it's it's choppy metaphors or meet God and the devil mm. that could work too but it's <laughs> It's 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 the fact that it's. I think the ambiguity... considering that I came at this initially with like the third wheel, which is a very simplistic approach to this, and I felt <laughs> that these were all just like metaphors for the one and a kind. Where like, well, there's that third element doesn't quite belong, and it's like to villainize the third element seems a little harsh. Then I'm a, I'm almost willing to retract that one completely, but it, it leaves me more confused than I was at the start. I think the ambiguity though helps the song to a point. I mean, it's got that kind of mellow, melancholy kind of sense. And I feel like the ambiguity of the lyrics kind of add to that. Since I misinterpreted it, obviously, at the very beginning, it really kind of lends to the strength of the song. 
Well, the the other ambiguity part is that those strings that come in and out and are really shaped very well on it. So that might be a, another connecting factor that you're that you're talking about there. Well, forget ambiguous. That was my favorite part of the song, actually. Maybe next to the uh, the sort of Lydian uh, synth melody in the hook, uh, and that was those pitch bends. The the the, the synth takes part in it and so does the strings they and both think have this like like constant you know hammering around different pitch bends hopping around uh hopping around the scale in different places it it, it, it serves as its own comping instrument for the duration of of the the later verses and it's all about the shaping of them the drawing them out and then like you say those bends but it's it's eerie, but it's not too eerie. The song itself is still not like a creep song. It's still not a, an, an evil song. It still has a lot of hope yeah, no, with those strings. It's just what I said with the, the little uh, Lydian connotation. It's like something's off, but it's, it's definitely not a strange song. It, it really just seems that that's the entire point here that I gather with, well, well there's three, there's three. And, and sometimes these things don't belong, and sometimes they seem to. It's like, well, something's off. And that's about as much as I could read into this. It seemed to really be purposely evasive. Which, which I mean, adds to more of that, what you're describing. Yeah. And there is one part that does bother me, and I know it doesn't bother anybody else here at the table. It's when they go into a bass guitar interlude area. What, what happens is, while the bass is still an electric bass, it, it, it sounds too natural for what was going on previously for me. It's a good point of melody it works within the framework of the song it's just the cadence of it itself without the synths without these strings and without the vocals kind of divorces the piece itself for me right well it was kind of it's an instrumental where essentially you're using the same exact chords that were present in the hook and where the synth would normally be we don't have that and said now we have a bass solo well all right I'm, I'm all game for a bass solo. I see John's point that it seems like a really strange departure, but I also kind of saw it as a breather for the track as a whole, which is why I was so accepting of it. Furthermore, what I liked best about it is that uh, the final refrain it remains in the song, the female vocalist steps forward and actually takes place, takes the place of what the synth was formerly doing and takes that Lydian melody, as I described, and now her vocals are doing it instead of the very, like, waning synth. I thought that was just a great tool because in, in many ways she's in the same exact register and it was a very, very subtle shift. I actually didn't even hear that the first time. Uh, and then when I noticed it, it was like, that's pretty, that's pretty clever. Just to supplant the previous instrument with it, the vocals. It added a strength to the song, I think. I, I get what you're saying, John. I just think that because the female vocals was on that same level as the keyboard, I feel like you didn't really get that huge gap. And that interlude that we did get a bit of a gap was necessary for the structure of the song. Right, so that by the time she comes back in, it's just like, was that what I was hearing before? Or was it something different? And indeed it was something different. From here we go to track five, The Cat with the Cream. Um, this song is a lot more reserved than the songs that have come before it. It still is within the same realm as the previous track is being a little slower, a little more subdued. Um, it has that airy vibe that the first track had, but... It, it's definitely a lot more reserved than the previous tracks musically and vocally, I feel. It's very reserved, but it's also very expansive. Here, the strings were oh, effing gorgeous. I mean, first of all, they're, they're constant. They're present for a... Well, how, this is a fairly long track, right? Yeah. This just creeps up to maybe six minutes or something like that. Um, and, and the strings are just constantly evolving throughout the entire track. It's not necessarily that we have, like, sectional changes. It, it, the track is, is fairly stable, um, but the strings themselves just seem to like it, they're kind of both a, an anchor and a form of comping at the same time. They're reacting to the whole and yet sometimes I feel like they're more important than the, than the vocalist because they're, they're pivotal in, in, in the setting here. But another thing that also kind of uh, creates the setting is this, this, this backbeat uh, which uh, you described as a, as a heartbeat sound. Um, right. And I really enjoyed that because uh, I couldn't actually think of it. I was actually just trying to describe it. And essentially, it's just like this kick drum every single beat. And then the bass uh, is every eighth note. So you actually hear that space where the kick drum is not playing and the bass is playing. And it's just this boom, 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 boom throughout the entirety of the track. It's a really, really nice uh, layer on which they do really, really gorgeous things. Well, there's a the thing about putting a heartbeat in a song that's kind of an old hat trick for making something more emotionally impactful. Mm -hmm. And it works because you're going to resonate with the sound of a heartbeat because it's one of the most personal and intimate things to the human emotion, especially considering 
you know how frail the heart is. Without your heart, you're dead. You're done. I mean, they have artificial hearts now, but essentially, <laughs> like, it's what you need for life, and it's an important part of life. So that connection rhythmically, also, also when you're a baby, like you relate to your mother's heartbeat, or even when you're inside your mother's still, like it's all of that stuff that's very right. natural. So it happens on like a subconscious level, and yeah. then on the conscious level, there's the strings. The strings are, are most most akin to the human voice amongst any instrument because of how they just taper off vibrate, and yeah. how they vibrate. It's, it's you know, when you hold that, you know, for a length of time, it really is just like a human vocalist, just, just um, belting it out. And the overlap here is much like a, a really dynamic choir. Especially in the chorus. Uh, the, the strings get much higher, and the vocals actually take a big step onto the higher range. And really... Do something that I, I was kind of missing from the album thus far really impact a lot of emotion uh, to me. Though I'm not quite sure what emotion is going on right here. It's true. Uh, We've had a lot of ambiguity up to this point. Yeah. But it definitely, <clears throat> out of all the songs, this is the one I found most, most emotional. It definitely pulls on your heartstrings to mm -hmm. talk about both elements. Yeah, and it, it really does kind of give away an emotionality, even if the lyrics are a little confusing as far as... Uh, content is concerned. Well, there was one word I had to look up, Tori, and that was specifically in the chorus. But talking about the verses themselves, they're actually talking about just really melancholy things, very depressing things. Praying for a friend is contagious, especially when it comes at the old kitchen table. Listening for the swoosh of his quickening paces, watching for the smile on the bravest of faces. How I wish you'd read to me, verses rich in swallows and trees, get me through the night. That ain't that ain't you know a uh, uh, Norman Rockwell painting right there. That is not. That's a little dire. This entire uh, track lyrically rings to me of of a, a bitterness about government and, and government policies and the way that it works. In uh, the you first mentioned verse. you mentioned that there was a a, a a word you had to look up. Well, of course, Tory only because we it has a different connotation for Americans than it does for the British. For us, well, it was the bad guys. They were the British during the American Revolution. But it's like for the British, it's really more of a political statement. It's just like, well, what side are you on? So Tory, like the cat with the cream. It's almost like this 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 almost like a, a, a game of cat's cradle in a way. Like, things are just playing off each other. I studied you in history. I studied you in the library. In days of old when knights were bold, they'd settled it with sword and shield. In days of old when knights were bold, bold it's settled by the king. But then the answer here is really more now that it's all bureaucracy. That's what I kind of gather from these lyrics at this point. It sounds like, like a frustration with government, almost, kind of thing. Well, yeah. And the bad things that happen as a result. The bad to you things, personally and on the larger scale. But see, earlier on, it seems to me that it's, it's less just like a, a generalized uh, hatred of government. It's really more specific at the bureaucracy and how slow things are handled. Yeah. You know, yeah. men in frocks debate all the policy changes. Everybody bet on the boom and got busted. Everybody bet in the government trusted. Grubby little red MP, yellow flapping homelessly. I, first of all, that's great writing. Yeah. Great writing. Mm -hmm. and, and the connotation there is obviously just like you can't win. You can't win. No matter what you do, no matter who you have your, your, your money set on, you're probably going to lose in the end because it's out of your control. There's a futility. Yeah. And I, I classified it as resigned depression. Or maybe just resigned melancholy. You, A.K.A. bitterness. <laughs> yeah. Not just bitterness. It's not really bitter. It's defeated. Well, okay. they, it they, does they, sound if defeated, you're that far yeah. along. There's, there's nothing you really can do right here. When you take that heartbeat that's a little bit slow but very steady you take those quivering violins which one yeah that was my favorite one. element was that was the track and the violins that was just a tremolo front to back and and it, it seems ended like, almost a drone the tremolo yeah kind of. it that, almost like the white noise of this bureaucratic system yeah, this, yeah. Mm -hmm. everything just came together to really make a solid single piece to really get the message across and that i think was where uh they accelerated that's the first time Speaking of what you said about the emotion really connecting here, is that everything seemed to come together exactly the same, exactly at the same level. Uh, this this is why it was one of my early favorites on the album. From here we go to track six, Enter Sylvia Plath. A.K.A. Disco in the Oven. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this is the second kind of club-sounding track that we get. Um, this is more 80s pop. It's It's... It's got this kind of techno-y feel that's very synth-heavy that you would expect from the 80s. I want to point out that I burst out laughing the second it started playing. Well, Both considering the title. Because of title and context and placement. Con considering the, the very, like, 
long, saddened state that I just came from. Which and I was look, more and then, I, and to then the name. I see the title, and I'm like, oh, enter Sylvia Plath. This is going to be even farther down the rabbit hole. And then all of a sudden, we're dancing. Like, that's that's how she made her entrance, which is the last way anyone would expect her to make her entrance. That, that, that is definitely an intentional gag, I think, and I, I thoroughly <laughs> oh. enjoyed it. I mean, the fact that they get you to this it. emotional place and then lift you up with this ridiculously catchy techno gallopy track I mean like it was very cinematic almost in the way it was delivered just because it had such a concise sound I would put it in like 80s fantasy territory I mean several different things things came to Flash Gordon Gordon, He-Man Master of the Universe just about any like cheesy 80s cheesy 80s fantastical story that you could come up with yeah and the gallop like you know something you know you're just on your way to to take care of things um, as the hero does but it's like I don't know. I, that was just so strange. On, like it I, I understand they want to jar us. It's just it, at this point I was also a little confused as to where the album is and what it wants to be and where it's going because it's <laughs> taken us everywhere. And yeah. like right now we're we're living with the love child of the ABBA and Eurasia. Exactly. <laughs> it's just well, okay. That is a visual. I'm just never getting out yeah, of my that's head. Right, it's a six way. It's <laughs> a six way. That's how it happened. Right. Yep. Um, a couple of other things here. Uh, Apart from just like this, this '80s sound. Of course, I'm thinking of a, of a prominent composer around the time uh, from the '70s into the '80s, and that was a Greek composer, which I've mentioned many times in this podcast, and that is Vangelis. Uh, normally, I reference him with regards to his 1976 or was it '77 album Albedo 0.39, which was a, an electronic masterpiece for the time, and it had similar little twangs, the kind of uh, synths that he would use, the sort of dated Moog synthesizers back at the time. I heard similar things in this track. In fact, even the outro here reminded me so much of a particular track on that album, Alpha, uh, which was the first track on side B, because you only listen to that stuff on vinyl. And it like it had this extended three, four minute outro that also sounded very um, fantastical in its way. And it's the exact same way that this track closed out. It was the only other case on this album where I, I detected a, a real keen reference. I can't say it is, but it's really, really close. Almost as close as the nursery rhyme incident. I mean, it's not, it's not impossible that they could be influenced by him, especially if it's something that maybe they liked but never really seeped into their work. But this is a venue yeah. where they found they could kind of express that side of themselves. Yeah, it was there in the outro, and it was there in the instrumental, and it was couldn't avoid it. But there was one problem with this, and that as a whole, it kind of faded back into the background for me. After some time, it's it starts to get a little monotonous. Yeah, it, because the gallop is just so pervasive. It's like, eh, I think by the fourth minute or so, it's like, eh, I don't know if I really feel like, are we going someplace? You have to also think about what are a track alive? like this is designed for. As you were saying earlier with the first track, that was a party dance track, it's not trying to be anything more than something that's going to get you up and dance. And that's clear from the the construct of this track. Yeah, but well, the content speaks to the exact opposite of that. Oh, I don't know about that. Well, you go first. The the content, when, when it has, has lines like, put your hand on mine and take me for this tired ride. Take me from this early night. From the sea and rain and countryside, if you take me, then soon I'll be your accomplice in words, and we will talk only in verse. Talk only in verse. Mm. That's not, you know, no, a no. dance song right there. Not yeah, but, I, I, I but actually, how, how many dance songs have lyrics that nobody remembers? I mean, but that's the whole point. I mean, the the lyrics are not su- really supposed to be important in a lot of these dance songs because they're not designed that way. Here obvious care went into lyrical work. Well, that's where I thought you were going, but I have kind of a counterpoint that fits almost a little too well. (laughs) That's the fact that, like, I I see a lot of... a lot of fixing going on in these lyrics. A lot of, like, improvement in such a way. It's like, well, come on, take my hand, I'll help you through this. Uh, It's a person that is just there for the other person as they go. And it seems to be almost constantly throughout this. It, it's, it's a it's a one-on-one story and it almost kind of hints that the gallop might actually be her road to um, betterment, self-betterment, as it were. Or just getting back on the right track. Uh, you constantly struggle for self-improvement. You have the ability to analyze and solve any problem. You are heading in the right direction. Your mind is creative, original, alert. Boy, you don't even know what you want. It, is, it, is, it isn't what you think it is. All the dreams and guilt and loneliness. Loneliness. Boy, if we were to be friends, subtle is the art required to draw the evil from this lonely pyre. Lonely pyre. Take this hand from me and guide me round your tools of work. Fashion me into your junior clerk. Let me live in shadows of your words, and when things get tough for you, as they did when you came up through the ranks, you can borrow from my faith. From my p- faith. 
and that becomes the refrain uh, that is repeated for the last remainder of the of the track, over which that same chord progression that I referenced that it was probably used in Alpha uh, by <laughs> Vangelis was used. And it's like, that's what it all comes back to, from my faith. You can borrow from my faith. Uh, whatever I have going for me, well, I pass down to you as some kind of, like, gift. It, it's, but, but, that's but, the journey. That's but, the gallop. But, but, but. I wouldn't say it's just completely a, a, an attempt of reaching out or anything like that because that from my faith for what three ish minutes three ish minutes thirty six times thirty six <laughs> times uh, you actually mentioned that it started to sound like indoctrination or something of that right. sort it sounds a little so creepy indoctrination by you. or mantra yeah and by that point it's less about trying to uplift you and it, it starts coming off as Sort of super fan that's a little bit too close, kind of a level. I, that's not very, you know. Try my Kool Aid. Uh, try my Kool Aid. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. That's a. Helter Skelter. I mean, what I, are you I, supposed to do? I do want to make a distinction that musically I'm not terribly impressed. I think yeah. it's been done before. I think it was perhaps a poor avenue. I think the artistic goal or. Per, or at least concept behind this, this merging of theme and avenue makes sense. Um. I think I like the message. I don't know if I see it as harshly as you do, <laughs> but it definitely is dull from a musical standpoint. I got very tired of that refrain um, from the 37th time, or <laughs> 36, only 36th time that well, he no, says, it's, it's, from my faith. Yeah, it's not repeated, but it is. it shows up earlier, so yeah. it might be 37, 38, 39, but who's counting? Oh, wait. We are, apparently. Yeah, yeah well. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a good opportunity, I think, to take on another track that takes us out of this doldrum, which is the seventh track, The Everlasting Muse. Oh, man, Everlasting Muse. The, right this away. This is number one. Number one for you, huh? Everything is just... Remember when I said that there was an early favorite? This one dethroned it almost instantly. So Steve mentions that this is a, clearly a very very bossa nova in structure, at least in the beginning part of yeah, the song. It's, it's all this just, like, bounce off, you know, and one, and three, and one and three and just that whole bounce throughout the entire track it's just you first of all it helps that it's being done by an upright bass as it would for any uh self-respecting bossa nova jazz band but it is being supported by a great snare and kick drum combination on top of that there's just the beat mm-hmm. yeah is, no, that was very dynamic it's so nice right away it's getting you into it and you know, it transforms. That's what's great about this song. It, it, when you get to the second verse, third verse, fourth verse of this section, there's always more elements being added to it. You get a light and punchy guitar with touchy piano work thrown in. You get horns and mandolin very late in the song. There's a lot going on here. The layers, once again, are being built around it and just adding to it without really diverting away from that really punchy bass drum combination that instantly in another ear weren't instantly enjoyable yeah it's a little subdued and it almost strikes me as like you know coming on at like 2 a.m at this like it's that kind of you know late night jazz band that's like the third or fourth band of the night it's like people are just kind of winding down at this point but you know sometimes that's when the most uh that's when the most pivotal thoughts are, are coming to your head and you're starting to question things it has that kind of like spotlight on it in a way through being reserved it managed actually to conquer something that had previously been the issue with me and bell and sebastian is that nothing really leaps out this was leaping out and that's not even the half of it yeah because at a minute and 40 seconds or so we get a distinct musical change that's on a dime but smooth as hell and it jumps into this kind of i don't even know how to describe it a balkan it's it's like a balkan a balkan folk uh, Shazam! I don't know. <laughs> Let's it's just, just go with there that. There is one very specific word: oompa. It is an oompa. No, actually, part. hoopa. If hoopa, you've ever seen um, uh, no, my like big fat Greek wedding, yeah. It's and it's. <laughs> I don't know why it works. But I it really does. don't because it no, shouldn't. It, it really shouldn't. It is. It is a, a very very bold departure from the whole. It does. It, it doesn't really match up with with bossa nova except serendipity. Yeah. Serendipity is what wrote this song to be as awesome as it was. Uh, the fact that these two, they make them blend together without even really attempting to blend them. And while it may have been a very sudden shift in the going into this, like, uh, bazooki-driven, uh, I think you noticed we were actually debating whether it was, like, a mandolin, and you, uh, right. and you mentioned it was a bazooki, and I was like, eh, I think that's it. But later on here, when it starts to go back into the verse... And that's the moment I, I noticed, like, it was kind of expertly composed here. It just transitions, and all of a sudden, it, like, 
I don't know. It felt as if it like wind down. Like we just kind of like slowed the uh, the phonograph player a little bit, and now we're back into going from like forty five speed down to thirty three speed, and it sounded natural because the two things were written in different speeds. Yeah, and it really did kind metaphor. of give. It really did kind of convey that that connection between the two parts when it came back to it. Yeah. But every time it goes back into that kind of uh, Balkan section, it's always a jump. Yeah. It's always a jump and then a flow back. And I kind of like that dichotomy. It really adds to that song. Gives it an impact. Yep. But that's not even the half of it. It is a beautiful explanation of a person's muse. I want to find this girl I know. I need to take her out. I'll set a snare in the evening air made of faith and hope and doubt. All right. Kind of simple, but he does evolve it. I need to hang out with my love, the raven-headed sprite. I know I'll never dance with her or keep her up at night. Just just the, the visualization of the raven-headed sprite. That's definite evolution in that description. He goes along, goes along, building this woman up, building her up, 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 up. But that's not the end of it. There's a punchline. And there's only punchlines in jokes. It's not a funny punchline. But it just so happens that she, the muse just can't stand his him at all. Hates hates everything about him. Or maybe hates the, the wrong word. Can't stand him as an individual. Because you get the final uh, area, the verse 3, where they start singing in unison. And it's a call and response. So you get, winds will blow and storms will rage. But your phrases are poor. The news is always sad. And you try hard to rhyme. Money tends to disappear. And I can't read your words. Beauty crumbles with the years, but I can read your mind. It's that call and response where everything he's saying, like, this is the beautiful part. This is where the inspiration is showing through. She's tearing him down. I, it, I, I had to start laughing as I was listening to the, the back and forth they were doing. What's amazing here is that from beginning to end, we get probably one of the most perfect executions of the pursuit engaged uh, over the course of this, of this arc here. Um, all the way from the more downtrodden to the more outlandish, and finally the proposal being, you know, made and being shot down. It's it's very very strange, but it's very effective through these two musical styles because in that sort of like bossa nova, like two a.m. jazz, it feels very much like the 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 rumination go, uh, transpiring. Like you're you're going over it in your head, and you're just kind of, kind of in a state of self doubt. And then all of a sudden, when it it, it it branches out to this uh, Balkan folk style. It's it. I couldn't help but think of only one band because I think they're the only other band I've known that's, that's actively run under uh, the brand of Balkan folk or Baroque pop, and that's Beirut. Beirut. I mean, despite being from New Mexico, which is really unexpected, <laughs> they are really, really good at what they do. And I, uh, the, their their frontman, their frontman's name escapes me right now, but. I mean, everything that he sings, down from to, to the way that he sings, down to all of the instruments that come into play, sounds so raw and so so old school, so traditional, as if, like, someone was not just trying to go after a girl, but really court them actively, you know? And you see this in the lyrics here, well, I would stand outside, uh, outside my window watching close. She will appear again, still polishing her crazy nails, still wispy, careless, drunk on song, if I could only right my wrongs and take her to my favorite place, and steal a melody, cause I need only see her face, and doubts and worries fall away, and music rushes in. It's, it's rich with old school romance at that point, and it's it, almost the music a conveys it, yeah. I mean, actually, the, ly the lyrics here, the writing, seem to really hint of, of the writing of Beirut also, so it was like, I was thrown in a place that I was, I was not, uh, not detesting. <laughs> but then it ends, and the way it ends is such a, a beautiful ending for the story that's going on here. Because it's just the lines, a subtle gift of modern rock. She says, be popular, play pop, and you will win my love. Mm -hmm. I love that. That was the final little like asterisk they put at the end, the final little period that they're throwing in there, just to really make this a realistic rendition of The Pursuit of the Girl. Definitely. The whole idea of tell me what you what you want me to do and she says change who you are. A subtle gift of modern rock be popular pay, play pop. That that's got to hurt a little. That's just that has to hurt a little. Yeah. 
it's it's a shame because to go to reach such a height, you know, not just for the song and for this album when he's really like at full state of pining, uh, to be shot down at the end, it's it's that's cold. It's tragic. It's really cold. Um, from track seven, we move on to track eight because that's how numbers work, and this track is called Perfect Couples. Um, interesting in the intro that we get a kind of hand drum. I thought they were bongos, but they could be other hand drums. Oh, they're that, bongos, I'm sure. Um, but. But it, it's a bongo intro with heavy rhythm percussion that is very unexpected. Even with the previous work, it just still seemed a little different from what we had heard before. Well, the bongo is very fast paced. It's all 16th notes at this point, And then also the xylophone steps forward. So you're also getting a little bit of pitch percussion in here. Um, which is interesting because the xylophone felt like it was almost like kind of on a, a state of dissonance. And there was something very experimental about this intro as a whole, the fact that it shows such thin uh, texture here. It was just really, you know, rhythm, uh, pitched rhythm. There wasn't a lot of meat. There wasn't a lot... I don't think the guitar was present at all in the very, in the intro here. It felt more like um, like a, 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 case of, a case of sound art. Yeah, there was... It was almost experimentation in tapping. There was snapping going on there. It was all hard percussion work. Yeah. No rolls, no drawn out beats, shying away from like the kick drum or anything like that that might boom for too long. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But just working on that part. Yeah, and the um, what was interesting is like in the first song, the xyl- xylophone was played, all the high notes definitely gave that childish feel. This was all the low notes, so it's um, the xylophone or it might even be a vibraphone. Uh, actually, I thought there could have been a vibraphone, in fact. Um, it also, and maybe one reason for that actually could have been like this, this little dissonance that it seemed to really hold out. That's the one way in which vibraphones are really distinctive is because they have this really, really long decay because using well, the electronic element, you can do that. You can just hold it out. It doesn't have to decay naturally. Um, but there was a case of dissonance here where it felt like they're just playing you know, two notes side by side, that little chromatic uh, touch. And that was present in the beginning, and then even once it started into the into the meat of this, which is a little bit more um, a little bit more upbeat, it still remained as like this accent just there on the second beat and on the fourth beat. Just again, like two notes played right together, like it was still kind of holding over some little element that was just stranger from the whole, some little little stray. And this is where we go into the into the theme here: perfect couples. Obviously. I feel like even just at the title, you feel like this is bound to be something a little bit sarcastic. Yeah. I mean, it's no not... one just sings about perfect couples and, and, and lacks uh, a kind of, like, biting criticism. Because well, it's hard to say the word perfect or talk about perfection without feeling sarcasm in any sense. Yeah. It's, so I thought it's... the dissonance there was appropriate that it maintained. It was all misplaced envy. One person saying, oh, I wish we were like them, but they have their own problems. That's what it boiled down to. It wasn't particularly groundbreaking theme work, but there are good uses of the lyrics. Dab hands for all to see, stroke of brush and poetry, his cut of cloths and contours of her hair. Thank you for the invite tonight. Perfect snacks, perfect drinks. I'm getting ideas for your in- from your interiors. Perfect apartments, perfect kids. That right there is, su- is sung with quite a bit of sarcasm in it. Right. But see, to me, I feel like you only have like half the theme right there. At the beginning, it really does seem to be a case of of envy, of envy yeah, through and through. Then at the end, really, I mean, or rather past the halfway point, it always lurked in her mind. Perfect couples are breaking up. What have they done in the back of her mind? Those perfect couples are now breaking up. What have I done? It always lurked in his mind. See, changing up the, the, the tense here. Those perfect couples are breaking up. What have they done in the back of their minds? Those perfect couples, they keep breaking up. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of like... I feel the criticism is not necessarily... It's more just the, pers- the, the, the innocent bystander, the third-person observer who may have initially felt envy all of a sudden just feels like these things are falling apart, and they're never as perfect as people make them out to be. He describes a state of perfection at first that all falls away. It's a very, like, an, again, kind of adding this little melancholy, bitter twist on something that should be a lot more, um, a lot more lighthearted. Well, there's also another aspect used here that hasn't really been used previously in the album, and that is the, quote... Phone vocals, the background pre-recorded, maybe coming through a metaphor, metaphor, bleh. megaphone, megaphone. Thank you. Words sometimes, or most of the time, at least. 
it's it's an interesting thing. It's something that I don't normally like, but it works very well in context. Uh, that, they start doubling with one another. They start actually singing in harmony with one another. It adds an interesting echoing effect between the two, and it allows them to do a call and response with two different identities going on. Yeah, and I think actually the melody was one of the strongest elements about this track uh, through and through. Also, there was a little strange thing here. Even from like that er experimental intro, which to be honest, on, on a personal standpoint, I was a little bit saddened that they actually gave that up for the more upbeat content that came later because I was more intrigued by the whole sound art thing. Um, but I don't know, that's just... That's because I was intrigued by what they started. But still, because of what they held, considering the xylophone and considering uh, certain other little things here, little dissonances that just, like, approach from the left and the right, um, I, I felt like they were trying to build a more upbeat track in the meet that was meant to embody a more lively romance, despite the fact that it's actually falling apart. Hence, the beat almost symbolizes a kind of pointless endurance at this point. And... Well, and uh, the xylophone is that foreshadowing, and it's the way I began to sort of reinterpret this track. It kind of added this conflict between the music and the lyrics that I think really gave a dichotomy to the song that really made it stand out. At first, you might have glossed over it, but at this juncture, it actually seemed to kind of really make it work as a whole. Yeah. It was more of an after aftershock, but it was, yeah. It's something that you would only notice after listening to the song a few times. It might be hard to catch on a first listen. Right. From here, let's head on to track nine. Ever had a little faith? <clears throat> this is where we get our first track that's truly reminiscent of Bell and Sebastian's sound from the 90s. A very folk influence, almost airing to the side of country kind of sound. Yeah, yeah especially it's got that lo-fi sound. It seems very underproduced, um, just as their earlier stuff as they were doing under the college label, Electric Honey. So, sounds like something that definitely could have been released right off of Tiger Milk. Absolutely. It has pretty strings. I mean, musically, I don't know what else to say about it. Well, it's it's, a, it's sort of a lazy, relaxing song, and, and while we've had a few exceptions to the rule on this album, really, this is the song that seems to fit the rule that I described in the beginning, the kind of thing that I could see, listen to, at the beach, cleaning, you know, all these, like, kind of passive listening things where you they can't exactly focus on, on the project, otherwise you'd lose focus on the task. But... Or not listen to music because you'd focus on the task. I mean, this is the issue here. I, I, I enjoy this track and enjoy it just as much as I enjoyed those previous albums, but I never really held them on a pedestal. It, it kind of is the reason why I just couldn't throw myself at Bell and Sebastian at the time. It seemed to be their strength, but I, I just it wasn't me then, and I feel like they've already proven they can go farther. Yeah, there is nothing new about this song. Yeah. Like, it... It is perfectly fine. I like it, but there's nothing new, and this is their new album, and I was looking forward to hearing, okay, where are you going? And this is this is going back 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's I, a lovely love song. Yeah. I, I feel like this was kicking around for 20 years, and they never uh, recorded it. It's like, hey, let's finally record this. Right, and it's also, like I said, like a lot of bands have kind of copied, or if not copied, certainly borrowed from their sound over the years. So ever since you know 1996, there have been plenty of lo-fi indie rock bands that tend to more toward indie folk and you know some of them have even kind of outdone this in a way actually i noticed that this sounds like the weakest of what the decemberists do in a in a way like pull the real filler songs off of a decemberist album that's kind of what i hear here uh i don't know it's again that uh, the country influence is about the only thing that i could i could describe as being terribly unique here the country element I don't know if they really incorporated that, but to be fair, there's a lot of bleed over back and forth between like the kind of folk that existed over there um, in Britain and then over here, where we would be more likely to edge toward country. So influence is bound to happen. The other issue I got is the content that's associated with the lyrics. We haven't had this sort of idea since Nobody's Empire, track one. I mean, since then, it's been a lot of satirical ideas or conflicted ideas or generally just trying to say something that seems a little bit deeper than than just your standard pop song or love song or indie song or what have you they were they were going for some really nice themes and motifs here it sums up as being hopeful being in love is being hopeful go after the guy do you spend your day second-guessing faith, looking for a way to live so divine? Drop your sad pretense. You'll be doing fine. You will flourish like a rose in June. You will flourish like a rose in June. Ever had a little faith? Ever had a little faith? This is just... 
be happy with who you are. Granted, uplifting is great. I love hearing songs about uplifting, but there's only so many of them that can really hit my ears before they just start blending together thematically and lyrically. To read this, it's great. It, yeah, it's really great poetry, but I don't see this really like... I, I don't see this turning heads a lot. It's a shame because the poetry is so beautiful. The thing is, over, overwhelmingly punchy, up, up, like uplifting songs that have a punch... They're not just uplifting. Like they do something else, either musically or thematically. This is just a good, happy song. And while that's not bad, it's not great either. It's just as good. I said, the poetry stands out, yeah. and that's like the same thing I could say for the Decemberist. Also, you know, I say like the worst of their work is not that bad, and you know why? Because of the poetry. Colin yeah. Malloy and his turn of phrase. He could turn even just a really, really like plain pop song into. A, I mean, not a masterpiece, but something that's really worth listening to because his turn of phrase is so powerful. Here you get kind of the same thing. Roll away the stone of doubt, girl. If you're calm, then listen Then listen out for a quiet voice. The sign from the window, passion beating on your brow. You wish it were, you wish it was now. First of all, I like that phrase, passion beating on your brow. I mean, you know, it's like some, you're, on the, you're on the verge of something good, and also the capability is there. And it's, it's, it's a very, like, uh, self-promotional song. Or in this case, well, the other person, self-promoting them. Another one of those tracks where they seem to be sort of, like, helping someone along. It's just one of those things where at this juncture on the record, we'd been getting so many different interesting things. Even in songs that we yeah. would get tired of, they still had interesting points to make or interesting moments. Whereas here... There's nothing that really stands out. It's very vanilla, you know, and vanilla is good. I like vanilla, but it not it doesn't amount to more than good. Yeah. And even with the poetry aside, I just a love hope song is not fitting with the arc. It's kind of a derailer for the theme for the arc of the overall well, story. Well, no, that's as, going as I said, here. we did have another fixing track, or as I saw it, sort of helping someone along. And that's the only connection I really see here, and I think the only real. Uh, the real artistic defense for this, um, as we often, you know, hate to do because they're not usually enough, but the only one is simply that I think the the, the ultimate uh, personal track will probably be a little bit thinner. It'll probably be a little bit like, eh, you grab a guitar, you grab whatever was on you at that moment, and you made a song, and it's for the other person, and it feels raw, and it feels kind of... Uh, thin down just because it, it, it it's supposed to be from the heart it's supposed to be impromptu I think it's why this is one of the thinnest tracks on the album that's about it yeah and I think that's that conveys that impromptuness kind, it, it sort of gives you an excuse but not really like yeah, it, it yeah. is and isn't from here we go to track 10 play for today um Okay, so this is where I start to get a little frustrated with the band. Um, you know, because at this point, like we said, there's not really anything bad on the record. The problem with this track is that from the moment it starts, it's while well, it's still got that light and airy feel that other songs have had, it's much cheesier and predictable. It almost feels manufactured at this point. We had moments earlier where we sort of like throw back to the 80s. We have not we have moments throughout our, our compendium of podcasts in which bands love to throw back to the 80s. I feel like I say this every episode, but we just keep stumbling upon uh, bands that love to do this. And even in the case of this album, we've had it several times. But they've done it pretty well so far. You know, they, they made it into a good track, or at least made us laugh in a sense. This feels like such a middle ground, such that the first few bars here, I, I was kind of like struck by it being a little bit campy. It feels like an 80s, like, whitewashed music video. The reverb, heavy organ chords just at the outset, and also the vocals borrowing from a... or felt feeling in the style, which isn't necessarily a critique, but feeling in the style of uh, another vocalist who was around back in the 80s, a gold frap. And we reviewed uh, one of our more recent releases back in episode 64. So it's like, I, I, I get all these different things, but it doesn't really amount to very much. I mean, the chord progressions as a whole feel very very cliched everything about this just feels cliched and that's not really the worst part the worst part about this song is its length yeah it takes forever seven minutes and 33 seconds which i think is one of the longest songs in the album and this had this had no business being the longest song in this album i'd say give me a few more verses of uh of um everlasting muse (laughs) there there were also uh, there was a discrepancy for me as far as the lyrics go and this is something that I I already see I'm going to be diving back into the previous content of this band and checking out their lyrics even if it's simple pop as as we could view by today's standards I want to see what they've been writing previously because here it's weird but it's weird for a very specific reason the beginning of this 
the the song itself is kind of campy as well. It's kind of yeah, I, I I would have expected a little bit better as far as the metaphors go. I would have expected a little more flower in the language or kind of well, more interesting context. That's about maybe the only thing here. I mean, when it comes to the idea why this had to be the the most um the most lengthy track, that I'm in a play written today about a boy who hides in attics when the sun is up. Everyone is at work. What will I do? Where will I go? Show me the way, the truth, the anger. Show me the rules of thumb. Show me the way to grow old. Love is a guide, the endless river of the soul. But we are mean, the dried up riverbeds of rock and stone. Lust is my friend. She comes to me when I am tired. That is kind of... Eh, that is that is not very solid compared to some of the other things. Yeah, yeah but... but at the end... <laughs> at the end, and this is the sad part... There is a long, almost soliloquy setup that takes forever, and this is where a lot of the length comes in. It is great words that get broken up by like 15 seconds per line when putting them together. would have done a lot to really sum up this song and, and put a good stamp on the end. Even if the beginning was weaker, this could have saved it. Well, my point as a whole here is by the time we get to that, it's, re- uh, it's really more of a, a, a delusion in a sense. And I feel like we get all these different uh, examples of, of moments where you're like kind of beaten down and then kind of brought back to fruition at the end, which is why I feel like this song had its length and it feels like kind of you're stuck in the doldrums. Yeah, and the song had this length, but I felt it didn't... This The song was no story. We were talking about how it felt like the... You know, the music you would hear during the opening credits of an 80s film. Yeah. And uh, then at the uh, four-minute mark, it felt like the music you would hear at the closing credits of that film. Exactly. Where's the content? Right. Where's the beef? <laughs> it had no hey, beef. Call back. Yeah. <laughs> but those final lines. You're king inside your head. You're sitting on a throne of sand. You're pushing back the tide. So lift the mountain up. So tie the writer's ribbons down. Assemble all your troops. We go to war with metaphors. You'll suddenly see sense, and when you do, I'll have the higher ground. You're not the king of me. I'll take my chance and play for tyranny. I'll build the sets. I'll light the scene. We're braver when we're on the sacred screen. I build the sets. I light the scene. We're braver when we're on the sacred screen. The backstage is your life. It is filled with props and lines you should have sung. The backstage is your life. It's filled with echoes of the ones you loved. That's freaking beautiful. awesome. Great. It is. You can't get it. Yeah, it's hard to just extrapolate it, that from the song. You're king inside your head. Pause. 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 You're sitting on a throne of sand. Pause. Like I said, it's written like a soliloquy, and there is a bit of a uh, duet going on with the back and forth, the male and female step in and out. That also adds some flavor, but the pausing is like, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And then five minutes later, you're getting the rest of the sonnet. What's going on? And also, the, the structure around this is very self-promotional in a way also. Like, you paint the comparison, Matt, to The Lion King because of it's those, those like, African tribal inserts in the background. It feels like you have, like, a, 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 a male choir line in the background going, ha, ha, you know, it's just, like, in a very, like, you know, tribal sense. It feels very raw and very, you know, uh, I... I it's campy. It's I, frankly, I, it's just it, I I can't take this seriously at this point. I mean, I see what he's trying to do, and I see kind of why this had to be the longest song, maybe from an artistic standpoint. That's just it. I think it's just the artistic standpoint that gives it any legs, but they're not very big legs. Yeah, I want I want it falls kind of flat. I just want to amend that. that earlier statement. I don't think it's necessarily a delusion. I think it's I think it's the state of being beaten a little bit before finally you have to realize that well, you are the king of your throne. You do have things Power. that you that you are you have things going for you. That's yeah. about it, and that has kind of been a running theme that we can probably tie to a, a good portion of this. There album is a week. positivity beyond it because even in the negative songs that are on this album previously, it was still structured in a way where they're saying, "Well, there's other stuff besides this bad stuff." Like even in Alley, dealing with that suicide, they kept saying, "There's other stuff in the world besides your problem." Your stuff yeah. is not nearly as bad as what you think it is. Deal yeah. with it. Yeah, a little bit. And there's here. a run, running theme in that in the record, I Even think. the political song. I yeah. mean, the concept that... Well, I almost feel like this is the answer to that. You know, you're king inside your head. You're sitting on your throne of sand. It almost feels like it's the answer to someone who feels like they're in a position of more authority than you. But, you know, the little man can change the world. It's a little bit of a cliched message, but I think it's, that's what they're going for. And, and they do it in a variety of ways. It's which is, well, very well stated lyrics. 
It's it's kind of well stated in other parts. It's just musically, we it comes and goes. It's, uh, it's on the nose. Yeah. Next, the book of you. This is track eleven, and so here we get more eighties pop. And at this juncture, I'm just like, I've had enough. I mean, we Why? hear yeah, we hear <laughs> it a lot already in albums as it is, but on this album especially, they keep going back to it. And I get it. I mean, they started in the early nineties, and so there's an eighties influence, obviously, to the band. Mid nineties, but still, that's still close enough to the eighties to soak a lot of influence from it for sure. Yeah. But I just feel like at this point they're kind of driving it home. It's the song. The best thing I could think of to say about it is it's unoffensive. Yeah, you know, I actually thought this as early as the last track, but something that was brought up back in episode one forty one with Devin here, "Wild Nothing" by John, the thirty year rule. Yeah, that's got to be it. The only answer as to why the eighties has to keep coming back, even for a band that may have been from that like well era, sort of. Or off the fringe of that era. It's like, all right, well, they do things that are maybe wildly new for the time, and then at their 30-year mark, removed from... They're getting nostalgic for these kinds of sounds. The only theory that I have... And that was John's theory. <laughs> it's not my theory. It's, it's a fact of life in my business. In my business, which is not just the podcast. There is one thing going for this song, and that is uh, the expose of the female vocalist. It's awesome. It's great. I love her voice. I stopped caring what she was singing because it really was unimportant at this point. There wasn't a whole lot of major metaphorical prettiness going on. It was another one of those I, I wish they could do a little bit better, get a little more flowery because it would have come off so beautiful. Well, vocally, and you mentioned this before, that really she should have been present probably throughout more of this album. I would have loved yeah. so much. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, her voice reminds me of everything I loved about the record label 480. Hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's the kind of thing that I, 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 I don't dislike his voice. I want to make that abundantly clear. Mm, no, it's great. I just think like, you know... <laughs> You've got that. You've got that extra thing. Use it. It's like you know, it would it's, provide it's a little like more dynamism a, to this album. It's like having a screwdriver and trying to screw a nail in with a knife. It's like you have the tool. Use it. There you go. There you go. Well, go no, it's that. like having a, a, a screwdriver and a power tool and using the screwdriver when the power tool will get it done better because the screwdriver is still adequate to the task. That's his voice. It still does great. It's the same thing. You just up the end. Yeah, but a knife is a terrible idea. You'll cut your finger off. Right. In this case, it's not a bad idea to stick with the male vocalist. He even works here very well. But the contrast with the female vocalist is so powerful. I just want to get that across. It's like a whole new piece of the puzzle coming in. Musically, this track has only one thing unique going for it, and that's the sort of like triplet motion of this. It feels like yeah. it's kind of in a very, very quick, like, uh, 616 or something like that. You know, triplets abound in this entire track. Uh, it leaves it a little bit more bouncier than some of the others, but I don't know, it doesn't have the texture or the meat to really thicken that up any further. We also get a guitar solo in this in this song. It's one of the only ones, but it's just, it feels almost uh, masturbatory, and it's very rambly. Like, it, it almost seems pointless. Yeah, it sounded like something that they would do during their live concert. And then there's no end to it. They just fade out. Yeah, they yeah. fade out they, on they fade that. Away. On it's on it's that. like there's a precedent for that in a live setting. I mean, in a live setting, it's like, well, people are, are there. They kind of want to see you do something that they can't get on the album. It's like, all right, well, they do this here on the album, but unfortunately, it just feels like a little aside, and it doesn't feel that good. It feels really, really improvisatory, which, well, solos are naturally improvisatory, but eh, in, in the case of a, of a studio work, I often felt that things should be a little bit more intertwined with the whole. Don't just... Settle on a solo. Pick the best solo for that you got in your back pocket. And this just doesn't feel like the best option. But if you're going to end with the lines of, we're always walking in the rain, and you're just trouble, so I claim, but then the world can see that I'm the one for you and you're the one for me. You That's have to sweet. show that love is eternal, man. you got to just fade out and be all like, oh, man, they're going to love each other. But yet it's the guitar sounds kind of wonky. Book, it feels like toward the end, it, it actually feels like it's, it's, not just, it's not just trailing off. It actually feels like it's kind of petering out. Like It's like, well, maybe that's all the first, ideas I got. But maybe they're, it's their first time for both of them. I don't know. I don't know whether Aww. insinuation I can actually insert into here to make it less tropey <laughs> or maybe even more. I don't know. Tropes aside, though, context and and uh, content to both this song and the previous do lead into the final track very well because there is a more positive air to the previous two tracks which the song is ending the album rather is ending on a higher note um, the final song of course that I'm talking about is track 12 it's called Today in parentheses then This Army's for Peace and I mean this is probably one of the most stunningly beautiful songs on the record 
um, regardless of what your favorite track is, it's, it really just is a striking, striking song. It's a perfect ending to the album, and it saves the album. Yeah, I think that if we had con- kind of kept on this path, we would have continued to be disappointed with track of track. This kind of pulled us out of that. I love today. It's my second favorite. It's it's like a mystical wonderland. Like you, you feel almost like you're you're. I, I had a sense of being submerged in this track. I know we 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 kind of use that comparison a lot in in description, but it's really really apt here. I mean, even just the kind of Indian feel that this has, it actually reminded me of of the the saturation that you get in in the Beatles track uh, "Within You, Without You," which was like almost the most it was the most airy track on the entire Sgt. Pepper album. Yeah. And I feel like it, it's it's pointed that we they use this time. Uh, I mean, they use the end of this album to actually pull that on us because the lyrics here is, is kind of like the, the build-up, the summation to everything that we've had so far. It's it's the the culmination where just we're finally like making a decision. I think based on of all the bitterness that has kind of like stood up to this point, and now it feels like this is this is the pivotal moment in which the decision will be made to either like make a life change or not. Today, I want to slip back to the dream I had. When you had urged me to look out upon the window of my life. Today the choices have all clashed upon my head. Is it wrong to leave your changes and go charging around the bend? To leave your charges and go charging around the bend. Um, it's, it's to leave your charges, first of all, I think that's kind of interesting. Like, charges? <laughs> like people you're responsible for yeah. or things you're responsible for. Yeah, I'll just then, abandon it all. But what's really curious is how they treat the chorus. Mansions, there are mansions in the sun. There's no hiding, defying the night. Come out to the light today. And that today gets a, a slight repetition to it. It's almost like a background kind of a repetition of today, today, because they go right back into another verse. That combination almost de- deletes the separation between chorus and verse. Not verse to chorus, yeah. but chorus to verse. It is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, also just that submersive feel, you know, kind of like locks everything together in a way also. You're just kind of like along for for the ride, like you just got caught in an eddy, and that carried you from the verse and the chorus, um, and vice versa. Also, I really love that line, mansions, there are mansions in the sun. I mean, what better way could you say, like, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, there's something on the horizon. There are better things over there if you choose to go for them. And then it does get a little... Defiant. That's what I really like. Even though the music doesn't evolve into a defiant tone, it's 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 that low key person who knows he's in charge, who 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 knows well at least in charge of his own destiny. Yeah. Well, also the the, the ethereal vocals though. Before you recite more vocals, the ethereal way he delivers them really adds to the repetition because it feels like someone speaking down to you, giving you this wisdom. A right. godlike figure, if you will. And then there's also another element that I think carries that like submerging feel, the uh, uh, the guitar. There's a very extensive like guitar figuration here, all eighth notes, but playing these broken chords. And it actually allows for those chords to change very, very subtly. Again, that, that subtle element, just like being caught in an eddy. It, 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 it carries over easily because, of course, it takes at least four notes for you to sufficiently change the chord because it, they're all broken and be just being played in order. If you were to do that all at once, there'd be a much harsher approach to this track. But that's a very, very astute way of, of, of building this slow, you know, evolving environment. And the whole, the, this song cements for me a, a sort of interesting theme work throughout the whole album, where it's, at its core, I kind of see this as touched by the angel on the album level. And it sounds kind of campy and stuff like that when I put it that way, but it's my best metaphor. And we're going to break out the best here. <laughs> the song, the, the album itself goes through the idea of a lot of detrimental things, a lot of sad, depressing pieces. Some of them should anger you. Some of them should 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 put you into the deepest depths of despair. But at the very end, there's that ray of sunshine. There's that hope. There's that point where you make the transition from feeling sorry for yourself or feeling sorry for others or having a problem and learning to accept it and to move beyond it, which, when you get down to the core of it, that's an episode of Touched by the Angel. That's why I'm using it. Um, it's it's a Hallmark movie in some ways, and it's a really very well-written Hallmark movie. To complement that really well, I, I have this, this sense that this track is actually utilizing um, time as, as a way to kind of bring that out. Like a, re- a revisit to all the different pivotal moments in your life in which you could have made changes or, th- or making a reference to times at which like you were, 
you may, you had a realization or times in which you uh, made a mistake and now you have regrets. So it actually seems to like utilize this this backward track motion. Like at various points, it seems as if things are being played in reverse. I remember there was like a, a recent video game that utilized this a lot. Uh, Braid was that the name? So it's not recent anymore. Okay, but yeah. it's not that recent. It's, hey, it's, it's not a gamer. It's this within the last four years. Maybe more than four years. Braid has been out now, but yes, within the recent uh, the last generation of consoles, it was on the Xbox and the place Xbox. 360 and PlayStation 3, and it was, yeah, it was a game where you would reverse time to get through obstacles, and... And the music followed Would suit. reverse as the well, The music yes. would reverse as you would reverse, and it actually sounded incredibly musical. It didn't just sound like, you know, the, the white noise of, like, rewinding. It, it was actually, like, you, you get all of those, you know, harsh decays just as you would have a high attack if you played it in forward. Well, you have a harsh decay now because you're playing it in reverse, and that's that, that quintessential reverse track sound, which I felt here. I don't know whether it was actually done that way by actually replaying things, it could have just been people playing that style and actually purposely make it harsh decay. It might have been an effect on the music to make it give that harsh decay. Yeah. But either way, it did give this idea of reminiscing and rewinding. Well, whatever it was, it was very astute. It really did, I think, solidify the song and the album very well, as le- at least on a theme level. Yeah. Do you want to take us into our wrap-up, Steve? Because neither of us want to. Nope. <coughs> and our guest gets to go last. Of course. They get to see how we do it. Naturally. All right. Ah, uh, Bell and Sebastian. I mean, I, I basically described at, at length early on about how I approached Bell and Sebastian in the past, so I kind of know where I would rate this among a Bell and Sebastian album. If I was just looking at their discography, pff, this would be like... I, I can't say it's the best, because I know that nostalgia for a lot of people would, would kind of want to take them to the past, but I know that I never really looked at those older albums in the same way I looked at this. Well, of course I didn't, because I didn't take them on Crash Chords. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't, you know, rip them apart. But I gotta say, I, I don't think I would have... I don't think I would have expected them to succeed as much. I think that with, in the case of those albums, I was less inclined to dive in because I knew that I took them as background noise. Because even for the late 90s and early 2000s, while I do think they had a very, very unique sound, there was that thing I mentioned that, like... From a marketing standpoint, eh, they really weren't pushing boundaries. They were just really, really successful in their niche because they had such um, beautiful melodies and a very relaxed style. I don't know if I would have considered that, like, you know, exceptional territory. I would have considered it just very good. But here, they're dabbling in a lot of other things. Now, the problem with this is that that's sort of one plus mark and there's another minus. And the minus is they're dabbling in a lot of things. And I think that actually kind of ruins the continuity here. Uh, in such a way that uh, their sound may be a little lost on me. Just just a slight bit. Like, I feel like it's it's so experimental in what it wants to reference. Again, it's a case of reference art. Well, you want a little bit of 70s, we got a little bit of late 60s for you, we got a ton of 80s in several different styles. Um, not each one as successful as the other one. But, I don't know, altogether, I just kind of get this mishmash. And I, I, I want, I really believe that a cohesive sound for an artist is important to to just kind of anchor any listener back to their work. So that way, if they hear something later, they can be like, ah, that was Bell and Sebastian. So far, the only real consistent thing that I see in this album is his vocals when he's singing. Um, That's a little light. I think his vocals are very strong. I think they're very unique, and I think he's probably one of the better ones we've looked at in terms of, of delivery. But I just don't think that ties together the band. And then I'm just looking at moments on this album. Moments that stand out. And moments are really, really big with me, but there there are very few. I mean, I think Everlasting Muse easily wins on this track. If we were, I mean, on this album, if we were rating tracks, that one would stand out far beyond the rest. The rest, we get interesting ideas, and then at the bottom of the barrel, we get run-of-the-mill, go-to Bell and Sebastian. With all of that... It may very well be, to me, more diverse than some of their previous work, but I don't know if it stands in, like, exceptional territory. I still think, though, the lyrics here are strong enough, and the theme is strong enough. I think this sounds this stands very, very close to, like, four territory. But the lack of cohesion, I think I'm just going to give it a little minus mark uh, to, to 3.9. It was going great up until track nine. That's where everything really started falling apart. Though I see thematically why the choices were made. It took a different turn than I was expecting. I wasn't expecting a hopeful ending. That that 
right away was not expecting to be uplifted with the final few tracks. That said, it was only the last track. It was only today that actually did the uplifting for me. It was too harsh going into Ever Had a Little Faith right after stuff like Everlasting Muse, right after Perfect Couples. It's it's a, that big jump that kept it from being a solidified theme through and through that really allowed it to progress to a more natural ending. Hmm. Honestly, if it went straight from Perfect Couples to today, there would be the same sort of issues. Today would just still be a great song. All that plus everything we said. I love the words, mostly. Hmm. Almost all of it. That's something that's hard for me to say about every album we review. Though a lot of the guys I've been raving about recently. And I'm I'm in the same sort of realm as Steve. They're... They obviously know how to make music. They're obviously very comfortable with what they do, even though, from my understanding, this is not the normal stuff that they do. They're still within the realm of what I would classify as indie pop. Well, remember, they're still indie, and indie does borrow. I think they borrowed from other things previously, and it tended to be more folk. But yeah, they're kind of broadening their palette in this album. Being indie pop, that... That they solidified that they have a stance there. It's just that there's so much borrowing going on, as Steve put it, as we've all put it, that it's it's it loses the identity outside the singer and lyrical work. So for that, I'm right alongside Steve, three point nine, just shy of four. Cool. Um, <clears throat> up front to say, as my voice starts to go, you can probably listen to the progression of this podcast and hear my voice slowly leave me. Anyway. Um, they're definitely not an average band. We've reviewed average bands at nauseum sometimes, and they're not, you know. But they're not, they're not obviously, you know, the highest level of five. You know, they're somewhere between average and five, and definitely closer to the 3.54 end. And the reason is, even their great stuff is great for them, but it can be ubiquitous in the world of music. Um, they have a lot of heart and we've said it to death that the lyrics are beautiful in almost every song, even the songs we didn't like as much. And that's great. But we've always said, if you have to read the poetry to get it, there's something missing. Um, and I mean, other, other than that, it's the greatest hits of what John and Steve already said. You know, today was great. I love the first half of the album. This is definitely a top heavy record, you know, nine, 10 and 11 suffered. And again, they weren't bad songs. Cause as Steve said, they don't really make bad songs. It's the only reason I feel like we might be rating them at a 3-9 a little harshly, because you're not none of the songs are bad. And I feel like the Four Territory is where we talk about the bands that are genuinely good to great. And they're good to great. Yeah. Um, well, even the songs that aren't bad, I kind of don't want to listen to again. And that would be my argument as to why I... I, I don't like them. That's fair. I just think for me, I'm willing to push them over that hump and put them at an even four because they are good approaching great and there are songs that are absolutely great and today is easily a four and a half to five star song because it's definitely going to be one of my favorites for the year. It's definitely in the running. And then, um, what was the other track now I'm blanking on? Um, Oh, Everlasting Muse. Everlasting Muse Definitely one of the more emotionally interesting tracks. Maybe not the most emotional track, but emotionally interesting because of the way it's conveyed and the satire and all of that. So for me, it sits pretty at an even four because the good is the good here is approaching greatness, and I want to honor that. Okay. Andy, all right. Give us your wrap up. You know, I have those. Nostalgic feelings about uh, their their early work, right. and it was those first three albums. You know, put them on; they were on the background all the time. There were so many ex- life experiences where they were playing in the back background, and I felt that each of those albums, every single song, was they they did as good as they could do. Um, this album, they're it's it's a meandering, uneven road. They are trying so many different things, and it's not not the party album. It's not the dance album. Uh, it's not classic Bell and Sebastian. There is some classic, 
There is some classic upgraded, uh, but there is not their new sound and their new direction. It's a scattershot. Uh, like John said, it's like first uh, five tracks. Fantastic. You got me. I'm on board. I felt like we're going on kind of progression. Everlasting Muse. Like, I'm going to be putting that on, um, you know, my next playlist that I put together. And that's going to be on heavy rotation for me, uh, along with today. Uh, but because I felt they could have done better with some of the songs and had a better progression, I'm only giving them three and three quarter stars. Wow. wow. Three and three quarters. Three, two, five. That's no, three nothing. and three quarters, but that's see, three, this seven, is, five. This is important math. because... Math. You should it's let important. me math you word. <laughs> it's important because we're, co- we're getting this perspective, of course, from someone with perhaps a little bit more familiarity uh, with Bell and Sebastian than all of us. So, uh, yeah, that, that's actually uh, not a surprising rating, considering yeah. you're, you're holding them up to the band, and, and that's just as important as someone holding them up against the pantheon of music as a whole. And me rating on a higher end is unsurprising when something emotional is involved. I mean, that's usually the way we go. Yeah. I tend to lift up above. And I'm looking on the more optimistic side. But I definitely get where you're coming from. I don't have as much of a history with them as you do. So it makes sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've been equally optimistic and harsh on bands we have history with as well. Mm-hmm. So that that sounds about right in line with where we expected. Yeah, right. But for me, there are like uh, three five-star songs on this. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know... There's I, songs making rotations for me. Yeah. yeah. I, I really enjoy the majority of the album, which is why I had to bring it today. Awesome, excellent. All right. It's also well, something I want to point out uh, as a pop album, and it, I really do consider it a very indie pop album. I want pop to do this. Yeah. That that in and of itself, I would love this to be the next like honest to goodness wave of pop because it it is done in such a way. It's more heartfelt pop. And they don't have to go the deep dark roots of what this album shows to be there. Like you don't have to talk about suicide, sure. But just to have a, a little more content-driven pop than some of the stuff that really does make the top 40. It's just like I said at the outset, they're closer to pop than alt is, but they have more, they have more depth within that. They're not as, as carefree as, as pop. There's always that little, you know, little malaise seeping through melancholy twang. There's something there, and, and it, it's just inviting, even within a, a, a pop veneer. So, we of course now will... Uh, gracefully transitioned by not bringing any attention to it, the section where we interview Mr. Andy Heidel. Um, so I'm actually very excited to have you on the podcast. As I've said before, we have mentioned the bar many a times because I am a fan of it as well as the guys. Um, but the first question I don't actually think I know about you personally as a friend is what made you want to open a bar? Was it something you always wanted to do or is it something you kind of came upon? I know you have a history in writing and you did promotion for a while. What led you to want to build a bar, let alone a nerdy bar? Uh, it's an incredible long road. And I realize every single job I've done and hobby has led up to me owning and operating a bar. Um, I've always worked in and out of food service. Mm-hmm. I've done promotions, marketing, uh, publicity, uh, carpentry, uh, minor plumbing. And um, so my first real career in New York City was working in publishing, and I was the uh, science fiction fantasy uh, publicity expert at Avon Books and then at HarperCollins. Oh, wow. That's okay. That's okay. a background. And so I was working with uh, Neil Stevenson, Neil Gaiman, Ray Bradbury. Okay, wow. if you were still doing that job, I would want to be friends as well. And Terry I mean, Bradbury. I don't... You have... You've had two really awesome jobs now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I left there and went to the Sci-Fi Channel and got to work on my favorite show, Farscape. Yeah. Oh, nice. Wow. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah what, no, was your, what was your not role? Not problems. Uh, I was publicist. Publicist? Okay, yeah. awesome. So um, I actually had them in town for a publicity tour, a press tour, on 9-11, uh, wow. which, yeah, that day really sucked. Yeah. I, I, uh, I and then sucked even more because I'm, you know, running around the city trying to make sure that they're safe and they have everything they need gotcha. and uh, taken care of and liaising with the hotel and... Right. And then running around seeing if I can donate blood or whatever else I could do. The hefty day. <laughs> yeah. Um, ended up leaving um, there because I had met Roger Corman and had accidentally pitched him a movie idea uh, <laughs> while I was uh, trying to get him interviewed during the U.S. Open. And the interview idea, what, or the movie idea, was originally called Survive This. 
So we were talking about the um, Survivor TV series and how, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if somebody on the island was ki- killing off the competition? <laughs> and he's like, wow, that'd be a great movie. Write me a treatment. Sure. Go online. Look up treatment. <laughs> 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 Write him a treatment. Send it to him. A week later, he's like, this is a really good treatment. I want to see an outline. Okay. Go online. <laughs> look, look up an outline. outline. An outline. <laughs> Write an outline. Send it to him. He's like, this is really great. Um, you know, it could use one more nude scene. And, um, but I really like it. This is one of the best outlines I've ever seen. Uh, I want you to write me a script. I'm going to pay you, you know, 17 grand in like these different installments. Uh, can you get it to me in a month? I'm like, sure. I get three books on screenwriting and I get a, uh, screenwriting software, final draft. And I start writing while I'm reading books on how to write a screenplay and I find so much is ingrained in me be- for structure because I've seen so many films and so like by the time I'm at page 10 of my screenplay I'm like reading my screenplay book so by about page 10 you should have uh, made your first establishment wrap up the first story and then uh, lead on with everything else and I'm like oh I'm right on target <laughs> so delivered it on time in one month uh, did two more drafts and actually got made. The director was Jim Wynorski, uh, director on such gems as Chopping Mall <laughs> and the Bear Wench Project. <laughs> and he transformed uh, my screenplay into a train wreck wrapped in roadkill. Uh, wow. And uh, renamed it uh, Treasure Hunt. That's yeah. an interesting catch, considering that, like, I imagine, you know, a, a 17 grand offer would probably get plenty more writers, like, actually part- actively participating in, in National Writers Month, which mm-hmm. incidentally is November. But then if the catch was that it'll be ripped apart and gutted, right. then, I don't know, maybe we're back to square one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so that was the beginning of my, um, you know, writing, uh, what is it called? I call it sabbatical. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a sabbatical, uh, read a a uh, couple more screenplays, none of those got sold, wrote a whole bunch of short stories and novellas, and I was so sick of uh, getting rejection letters on my first round of uh, short stories that I self-published and uh, created my own uh, collection of short stories, so like hand-bound, hand, hand-printed. Awesome. Uh, I made 10, gave them to friends and family, and I had one left over, and I would sent that to Ray Bradbury for a Christmas present. Oh, nice. And wow. he sends me back a fax saying, Superb Sterling Bravo. All and right. And I called him up, like, uh, Ray, can, can I quote you? He's like, Sure. <laughs> I'm like, I've got a Ray fucking Bradbury quote. The testimonial <laughs> of, uh, of a lifetime. That's not bad. I, I'm going to do, do a bigger print run. Yeah. Uh, so I printed up 5,000 and uh, got it carried in Amazon and stores all over the, um, all over the country. Uh, got some more reviews and also got a phone call out of the blue from Harlan Ellison who said he saw the review in PW and someplace else he's like you know what I'm going to tell you the story about this cowboy who wanted to be a writer and it's a really 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 long story and he's like and so at the uh, point of the story is at the end of the story that the cowboy meets another writer at the bar and the writer says you're not a writer until another writer says so well, our Andrew Heidel, I'm telling you, you're a writer. <laughs> so I had Mr. Crotchety <laughs> call me up and tell me I'm a writer. Uh, and so after that, I now have Ray Bradbury quote, Harlan Ellison quote. Uh, I've got all this other material, and I know I'm not finding any place in the U.S. to publish a short story collection, but man, those Brits like to read. So did a search for Ellison, Bradbury... Uh, science fiction, fantasy, small press. Found PS Publishing, sent them a query. Uh, publisher immediately got back to me, said, send me, send me your manuscript. Called me back two weeks later. He's like, I want to buy the book. I love it. <laughs> so that's how I got officially published uh, for the first time. And it's the, uh, the book's called Desperate Moon. Hmm. And it's uh, three collections of short stories. The first one is Angry Sunflowers, which is more metaphysical. The second one is called Desperate Moon. Uh, which is science fiction, fantasy, and the third is called Weep. Awesome. And, and this is available uh, just about any bookstore? Uh, Active and published? 
Oh, Kindle. All right. No, Actually, awesome. the first one was Angry Sunflowers. Okay. Awesome. Well, what I love about your story, first of all, is that there's the, the perfect amount of both serendipity and also just like pure good old-fashioned gumption mm-hmm. that it's like I feel like it's a good old-fashioned success story in such a way. Like a lot of people, it's like, eh, it's who you know, man. But, yeah, you you went through publisher to publisher and finally stumbled upon the one that, that, that got you in. And uh, that's what every writer hopes for. But we still have not hit the crux of the question, which is how do you own a bar now? Well, be Funny story. <laughs> so my last job in publishing was assistant director of publicity at Houghton Mifflin. Uh, America's was, until recently, America's oldest independently owned publisher. Mm-hmm. And when I left Penguin Books to go work with them, they assured me they'd be around for a long time. Funny thing, seven months later, they merge uh, with another publisher. They let go 500 people. I'm out of job. I spend the next six months looking for a new job. Every single time I'm just about to get hired, the company has a hiring freeze. Mm-hmm. So now I'm not finding a job anywhere. I fall back on bartending. And I'm working at this place called Beast Restaurant on Vanderbilt in Prospect Heights. All these customers are coming from Washington Avenue saying there's no place to eat or drink over there. A little light bulb goes off in my head. And it's around this time that my mom sells her healthcare company and uh, has a nice chunk of change, comes to me, says, I miss uh, being part of a business. If you come to me with a good business plan, I'll invest. Wow. So I came up with the idea for the way station. I knew exact, the exact location for it, where I'd have cheap rent, I'd have built-in customer base. And uh, so I maxed out all my credit cards, borrowed from the rest <laughs> of my family. And uh, that was almost six years ago. Uh, that I signed the lease. Wow. The anniversary is in Ju- uh, July, right? So, Oh, no, February. The, the lease anniversary is in June, and it took me a year and a half to finally get open. So the, uh, yeah, the four-year well, anniversary was this past February. So what I gather February. was a kind of unexpected second career plan in, like, just something to have, like, yeah. on might the be side, third, which might be is fourth. almost just as fulfilling. Mm-hmm. Might be third, might be fourth career. Yeah, well, that's true. On. There was a lot yeah. of others in there, but, yeah. And so when you were sold in the writing, though. when you were when you were when you were investing in the way station and creating this awesome bar, was there always a plan to make it a music venue too, or is that kind of was a side thing? Well, the reason why it's a music venue is uh, there used to be a great bar in Prospect Heights called Freddy's, which Barclays Center uh, had to demolish because they needed that small square plot of land. So there, I knew there was no music venue uh, in the neighborhood, no live music, you know place for any of the local musicians to play uh, so I wanted to make that part of my mission was to give local musicians a place to play also I knew that every single band I had uh, t- to play my place would bring in and introduce my bar to new people right and then every single day every single week I have something new to promote and get press for and constantly keep my name in the newspapers yeah, it's amazing with how big of a place that Brooklyn is it's like a really Williamsburg has held the crown for like the past 20 years as being the premier spot for music venues and it's just, there's no reason it should really just be consigned there of course there are other places around but it's just like that's the that's like that density that people always look at and there's no reason that should be there's a lot of other places in Brooklyn where there are just these like gaping holes and, and you stumbled upon that and kind of made you the king of that 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 hole <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to talk about the bar itself, we've we've talked about it at length. There are faux steampunk guns hanging on the wall. There's a TARDIS bathroom stall. Awesome fans. Yeah. Like it's, fans on fans. It's a, it's a very nerdy place. We've already mentioned that multiple times. It's also a music-driven place. But one thing that we, were, we actually talked about earlier before the show is that it's a very unusual combination of these two things in that... Because it it tends to be a nerdy place like the karaoke night, it's nobody ever gets booed. I've I it's it's one of those places that curiously it seems to always be happy. I've never been there when there's a problem. I've never been there at a karaoke night where someone coming off the stage doesn't get a round of applause. How do you think you establish that kind of an uh, an atmosphere in this bar? It's it's just unusual. Yeah, um, I grew up. A nerd, an outcast, played D&D, was bullied. <laughs> wow, that sounds very familiar. Right? Yeah. And um, so I wanted to build a bar that I would want to go to. And I knew it wouldn't be a 
you know, I've gone to country western bars, rock clubs, this, that. I needed it to really reflect me. And that's why I went with the, uh, the steampunk motif. Uh, cause it really embodies the best of science fiction fa- fantasy and it's an, it's a beautiful aesthetic. Uh, it's also all my favorite colors, you know, the, uh, burgundies, brass, silvers and, uh, well, mm-hmm. a little bit of silver, but lots of, silver. of golds and burnished yeah. metals. And, I'm right uh, there with you. <laughs> right. And, um, the TARDIS was actually a Bob Ross happy accident. <laughs> <laughs> so we were in the process of uh, building out the space, and it was me and Doc Wasabasco one night, late in the bar, just looking at that raw corner, and I'm like, oh my god, the shitter is right next to the bar. Who's going to want to sit there? <laughs> we have to disguise it somehow. And he just leans over to me and says, let's build a TARDIS. <laughs> and we both started chuckling. We're like, yeah, that'd be so cool. That'd be so awesome. Let's build our own TARDIS. And we had no idea that everybody else would think it was so cool okay. and awesome and amazing too and bring people in from around the world was well, it a you, self what was it like did you contract that out or? Uh, doc built it from doc scratch from it. scratch yeah. carpentry you know, everything you've actually had a doctor or two show up and sign the walls in the bathroom which that's is... right matt smith karen gillen steve moffat matt and um steve actually came and saw uh his season finale with the rest of the fans in the bar which was amazing yeah, they, apparently Stephen Moffat was looking in the city for somewhere to watch the episode with Matt, and a fan of the way station said, oh, well, have you heard of the way station? No. Well, here, go here, this address, and they just turned up, and the bar packed out. It was incredible. And to sit in the same room as the actor, the lead actor of the show, as his final episode is airing, when he leaves, when he, he goes away, it was pretty powerful. You know, it also has the kind of thing that apart from just simply being a, a popular element that all obviously all fans of, like, Doctor Who are going to find cool, it's really something that appeals, I think, to, like, London urban culture and New York urban culture because they really, really like doing unique things with hole-in-the-wall places. And it's just like, hey, go there. Go there and spend a night there because, I don't know, it's cool. <laughs> That's it. They like hopping around their uh, their neighborhoods. Well, it's not really a hole-in-the-wall kind of a place. You actually have a great location. You got pretty good parking you right off of a very main street it is a great location but i certainly it's not like you know put it down it's, uh, that's that's part of the appeal of like new york culture is that well venues they're they're not gonna be huge that's just Im- impossible to make them huge unless you're a stadium yeah. yeah exactly you know what do you want to go to terminal five for every single concert it's like that's not really the appeal the appeal is for the little more like of an intimate setting uh which brings me to something else a question for the different role that you play, for instance, on this podcast is that we're so accustomed to having artists come on and tell me their perspective as like aspiring artists and what you've been doing here and there. Well, it's like you kind of covered that from your writing perspective, but now all of a sudden you have the other side of the coin. You're the proprietor. You're in, in, in a way really the person on the opposite side of the interview table, the interviewee, and being like, well, I'm going to pick you out. I'm going to promote you. I'm going to host you for a night. And if you're good, you'll be back. How do you make these decisions in general? Uh, the very beginning, it was... You know, trying to find uh, performers to play. I was actually chasing people down the street who were carrying instruments. And, uh, <laughs> encouraging them to uh, submit material to me. Play my uh, bar? Play and my bar. I was uh, using uh, sites like Reverb Nation. And um, when I was a uh, DJ on the radio, I had the Pseudo Iguana show at uh, WHUS, University of Connecticut, with uh, my best friend Brian Albright. And, you know, there were some DJs who would put together their entire playlist, know exactly every single segue they were going to do like two days before their show. We would do everything on the fly. So we had some of our favorite songs and then we had the stack of everything that was brand new and we'd throw on a song and then we'd start ripping through the vinyl, throw it down and just listen to like 10 seconds of a track. Nope, not that one. 10 seconds of a track. 5 seconds of a track. Nope, not that one then. Wow. And we go through three records uh, during during one track until we found that right song that would be the best segue. And so it was DJing that way that trained my ear so that within, you know, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, I could tell whether or not that band was right for my bar. Right. And for the uh, the music series that I wanted to do there. I knew I didn't want to do any punk rock, heavy metal, uh, loud rock and roll. I wanted to do pretty much everything else, have an incredible eclectic mix, and feature the future of music. 
Right, but of course there's also that like necessity there, even for just being a little bit harsh, because uh, you have a business, you're mm-hmm. in a business to run, you, you can't really just throw in people willy-nilly, I mean, especially once you're farther along in your identity, and it seems like you had a pretty clear identity from the start, so it's like if you know what you want your bar to be, then you kind of know what the music has to be, or has to fit. It's not that it's like this clear-cut and dry method, but you know, you need to acknowledge, even like as an artist, that that's something that... You need to know where your work is going to be popular, just like a proprietor needs to know that their work or that certain music is suited to their environment. It's just that's how you make money. Otherwise, people feel that there's some kind of like mismatch going on. And then you have five days of music a week. Plus, yeah. Sundays, you were saying Joe Rude shows up for karaoke night. That's right. And uh, Tuesday through Saturday, it's three to four bands a night. Um, we're getting bands, international bands now, nationally touring bands, guys from around the corner. And um, it was uh, over the course of the first two years that we really figured out what worked, what didn't work, and what works at what time and mm-hmm. on what day. And so I was the major booker for the first two years, and I brought on my sister, Gail Heidel. And she was helping me at first with promotions and scheduling and uh, putting together my calendar. So by seeing what I booked at what time and on what day... She learned my ear for the sound that I wanted at my bar. And then when she saw who I rebooked at the same time and date, that's how she knew what sound works best and in the calendar. Is it, is it a case where you look at like a, a certain window, a certain time frame window, and then you say, well, this, this time frame window with that particular feature made X amount of money? And then you would just like trial and error at first, being like, let's try something else at that exact same time and just kind of like work it out until you have a... Uh, a successful, you know, right. chart. Yeah, and yeah. then there, there are bands where I know are, you know, this is a great, you know, funk band, party sound, big sound, and they're from out of town, so it's like, let's have them 10 o'clock on a Saturday night where mm. I've got my built-in audience right. and have them do two sets. Gotcha. That, that is something I guess I never really looked at before. That's actually, <laughs> re- no, it's really interesting. As I said, we don't really hear the opposite side of the coin, but it's like, this is... This is booking. This is the nature of how of how artists get popular. All the people that we feature, a lot of times, it's just like, well, you know, I'm just trying to make it. <laughs> and it's like, it, it, you got to be really keen about this. You got to kind of go into it being a little bit of a financier. From the sound of things, it's it's you've cultivated a uh, music community around your bar, and at the same time, you've kind of cultivated your regulars to the music around your bar as well, uh, which I think goes back to some what we were talking about earlier, like. The atmosphere itself in the bar, the fact that everyone is really just nice. I've had, like I said, no rude people, no fights, no nothing that I've actually ever had to encounter at the bar. It's like astonishes which is you weird. somehow. <laughs> I've been to many a bar. I've been to many a different drinkeries, eateries with without music, and frankly, it's unusual. I gather like eighty percent dives. <laughs> the thing is about the way station. I think that's important. Is it's a community beyond the bar. The interesting thing about the way station versus a lot of other bars is most local bars you go, you know, the bartenders, you have a drink, you go home. But here, this is the only bar I've ever been to that I've become friends with most, if not all, of the bartenders. Hung out with most, if not all, of the bartenders outside of the bar, and activities have been created for outside the bar or around the bar or in various locations. Like this past Comic-Con, you were featured on their list of venues hosting Comic-Con-related events. And that's that builds out the community even more. But the fascinating thing to me, as someone who's now married to the love of his life and met her at your bar, you create this environment where you can really cultivate a friendship and a relationship. It's not just a loud bar where you go and just disappear into the night. There's an environment and a community that's really strong behind it. And I think that's what's the best thing about it. Was there always this sense of community that you wanted to create? Uh, of nerds, for nerds? Was that always the goal? Uh, by nerds, for nerds, absolutely. And um, I think me being such a presence there, and at first it was I was bartending every single day. Mm-hmm. and bartending uh, side by side with my other bartenders that I brought in and setting this tone and bringing in bartenders who I knew were good at introducing uh, regulars to each other. You know, so you overhear a conversation one person's having about a certain subject and you know the other person sitting at the end of the bar is interested in that. You get the two of them talking. <laughs> Commute, and, get together, exactly. push up to school. And there, there are too many bars where the, the bartender just doesn't care about 
introducing people to each other when think, people show up alone. That's also like a, um, an interesting little crossover that you created because of the fact that you have a lot of like afternoon activities and things like that. I mean, like, well, it's not all just like music at night and play a movie during the daytime and such. And it's kind of like this little interesting blend between like a coffee shop environment and a bar where it's just like, well, you kind of get the best of both worlds because a coffee shop environment is, is, is was traditionally like a little bit more approachable than the bar would be. And yet you've kind of just like fused them together. You can pop by in the middle of the afternoon and something's going on and just feel like you can have a beer and not feel like you're the loner in the midst. Well, that's just the thing at the way station. You never really feel alone there. Like I've gone there by myself and when I walk in, it's either the regulars that I know that I see and I feel like I'm not alone or I make a friend. Like you sit at the bar and I'll be talking to Katie or Dot or one of the other bartenders and then someone else next to me will chime in based on a comment I've said. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I guess that only brings me back to my final point, my final question for you, is um, obviously now having talked about like your role as a proprietor and, and touting the way station, of course, as the kind of cheers <laughs> and the place where you can all go to, you know, to uh, pour out your troubles or, of course, maybe get off your troubles. Um, I want to like swing it back to your, your art, which is, of course, your writing at the end. And it's like managing a business is a big full-time job for many, many people. And I notice a lot of people that are in any kind of retail, even if that's just, you know, the the the, the night-going stuff, it's still, it, it's retail, it's very taxing. There's a lot of stuff that you need to keep on top of, uh, apart from just booking to, you know, accounting and stuff, uh, inventory and everything. It seems like that's a very, very difficult thing to to grapple with art alongside that, which can also be very consuming if you want to be a success at it. So what do you find uh, has been your... Obviously, you you've clearly made a success out of it. You have something published. How do you how do you split the two? Um, well, up until recently, I haven't written anything at all. I uh, have not had the time. Have not had the energy. So it was a hiatus and for it, sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, ever since the uh, the layoff, right? You know, I was just so worried about you know making the rent. Couldn't even focus on uh, being creative. And now I've finally gotten to a point of feeling comfortable. You know, the bar is in its fourth year. I am doing, you know, doing well. And I'm telling my brain that it will be okay. And I'm trying to step back just a little bit and give myself some breathing room. Right. Uh, so, you know, I've always had Sunday off, but I've been so burnt out by Sunday that I haven't been able to do anything. And so now I have Monday nights off. And so I'm taking Monday nights and going to... A, a bar that is not mine and writing longhand and then taking that back uh, home and then and putting that to the computer and then continuing my writing on the computer, print that out, and the next day hit another bar, do edits, continue writing longhand, and mm -hmm. uh, then after that, shelve it for a week, come back to it the next week, fresh eyes, <clears throat> but the, uh, the idea is still there, so it's, I'm doing much smaller steps, but... I'm moving forward. So it's kind of like working it into your system. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's also like a really big thing. It's just time management at the end is I think everybody's biggest enemy because there's just so little time, you know, to, to both make money and do the things that you love. I think for a lot of people, it just takes time. Perhaps that was a necessary hiatus in order for you to kind of come full circle and feel satisfied with, uh, <clears throat> with, with the moneymaker, you know, in order to kind of go back to the other thing, which may in the future very well be another big moneymaker. Um, so, yeah, more yeah. power to you. Yeah, I could easily spend 12 hours every single day or more at the bar. Yeah. Uh, because there's so much to do. The idea is work smart, not hard. Exactly. Delegate. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, before we wrap up, um, are there is there anything specific upcoming for the way station that you would like to promote on the air for our listeners? Oh, this summer, it's amazing. The uh, third week, third week of July, we are hosting the second annual Prospect Heights Music and Arts Festival. And this is a uh, five-day event, which takes place at over five different venues, featuring over 70 musicians and solo artists. Uh, also sponsored by Six Point Beer. Nice. Hey. Yep. <laughs> and um, so be sure to check out WayStationBK.com for all the information. Awesome. Or click it in the link below. Um, we will feature that, of course, in the in the post. We'll feature a link to the website. Um, before we let you do our wrap-up and our sign-off, Steve, why don't you give us our Spam of the Week? Spam of the Week? Are you saying that we don't have real mail? Is that what you're implying? I'm not mm. implying. I'm flat-out saying it. Well, uh, hey, well, hey, you could be all like, oh, no. It was, I'm not going to be ginger was... about nothing. Rip the damn Band-Aid off. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, personally, I think that um, this writer will be very insulted by that, because he has to say, Hi there to everyone, as I am truly eager of writing this weblog's post to be updated daily, because it consists of fastidious data. That's it? Well, that what comes, did he say about our that, data? <laughs> it's very fastidious, and that comes courtesy of 4 Minute Abs Book Review. <clears throat> He's fastidious. You don't even know what fastidious means. I'm pretty sure it has something to do with an infection. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to ignore that and move on to Steve telling us our pick for next week. Yeah, pick what is it, Steve? Week. Ah, yes. So Stop this is Steve's this. pick for the next album. Oh, I do want to mention, though, um, we did have a comment recently with an album suggestion from Star F. We will get to that in the month of June. We just haven't figured out what day yet. But oh, that I should will have read will... Star F. Well, you did read it. Oh, oh yeah, week. I did. That's right. Okay. So we will get to that <laughs> We're album. Down. We'll, we'll get that album suggestion out uh, done this month. All right. Well, next week. And I got John all excited because I said it was going to be Electronica, and he likes his Electronica. We're doing Prefu 73. Uh, for those who don't know, Prefu 73, not just Electronica. It really, first of all, it's, it's not a band. It's not a group. It's one guy, as many Electronica artists are. It's, it's an alias. In this case, the man's name is Scott Heron. And he, Prefu 73 is only one of his many aliases. He's done lots of work under many different projects. And Prefu 73 was originally touted as a kind of opportunity for him to engage in, I would not necessarily call them mashups, but he experiments with existing material. And then he builds off of it and he makes it into his own. Now, we haven't done anything remotely close to like a mashup album ever since Neil Sisirga's Mouth Sounds back in episode 94. Well, here, we're going to do that just a bit on a larger scale. It's not comedy, it's indeed sound art. But I don't know whether Prefu 73 is actually continuing in that direction or whether he's just engaging in full fledged uh, electronic. Needless to say, it's interesting. What's the new album called? The new album is called Rivington Now Rio in Portuguese with a little squiggle over the A. Till day. It, it, it's a swaggle. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so I guess we have that to look forward to. Yay. Yeah. Um, Andy, I just want to thank you again for being a guest on the podcast. Um, we're shaking hands for those who can't see because it's audio. Um, it was you know, firm. It was good. You've been a huge influence in my life personally, and of course for artists we've brought on the podcast, for artists who come on, come to your venue after being on our podcast, and it's just... It's, you're doing something really important for Brooklyn and I think for the community of nerds in this borough and state. So yeah, you take got, that. You got two million people riding on this. No pressure. <laughs> right on. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all for uh, having me here on Crash Courts where music is life and life is good. If you enjoyed this and other album analyses, topics, and guests, please subscribe to the Crash Chords Podcast on iTunes, where you can also rate us and review us. For more media, also subscribe to Matt's one-on-one -on -one interview series, Crash Chords Autographs. To receive emails on all new content, subscribe at the top of our homepage. Also receive updates by liking us on Facebook, following us on Twitter at Crash Chords Web, our Tumblr, and our YouTube channel. And remember, keep the discussion going, because music is life, and life is good. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to share them in the comment board below each post. Otherwise, email us directly at admin at crashchords.com.